allegations of mismanagement in the administration of Section 8, housing rehabilitation contracts by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Today, Chairman Lantos and his colleagues heard from former HUD officials. Subcommittee will please come to order. Before commenting on uh, this morning's uh, witnesses and subject, Chairman would like to express his very deep appreciation to the vast number of uh, hot career employees who have written uh, indicating their support of this uh, inquiry and to express my respect for the professional, honest, hardworking job that clearly the vast majority of hot career employees are doing under the most difficult of conceivable circumstances. The hot career staff has not only been decimated, but its uh, internal opportunity to supervise many of the programs has been severely restricted by unreasonable cutbacks in their travel funding. And I suspect that one of the results of our inquiry will be a very careful examination by Secretary Kemp of the needs of hot career people in terms of staff support to carry on their responsibilities. Secondly, Chair would like to announce that uh, after the 4th of July recess we will begin a series of hearings on mortgage fraud as it relates to HUD. The loan insurance program, of course, has uh, been catapulted to the center of national attention in recent days. Uh, and uh, we are preparing a series of hearings on the question of mortgage fraud uh, as it relates to HUD. Finally, uh, want to indicate we will begin a hearing or a series of hearings on the Arlington, Texas uh, case uh, that has emerged in uh, recent days. This morning, uh, the subcommittee continues its hearings on the mushrooming scandals of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Today, we will be revisiting the use of influence peddling to secure scarce and valuable Section 8 moderate rehabilitation funds. At our hearing earlier this week, testimony was heard from Mr. Paul Manafort, graphically showing how the system operated in a political manner and demonstrated the need for objective criteria in awarding these scarce rent subsidy funds. While local officials from Upper Deerfield Township, New Jersey, viewed the projects as a tremendous waste of taxpayers' money, HUD funded this unworthy project while rejecting many of vastly greater merit. The selection system then in place at HUD for awarding moderate rehabilitation funds was not based on the merits of each application. Rather, the game played at HUD headquarters in Washington was, let's make a deal. Our three witnesses at today's hearing are all former high-ranking HUD officials. Mr. Joseph Strauss was a special assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce from May 1981 through May 1983. Mr. Philip Abrams served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing and subsequently as Undersecretary for housing and urban development between 1981 and 1984. Mr. Philip Wynne 
who is currently the U.S. Ambassador to Switzerland, served as Assistant Secretary for Housing between April 1981 and March 1982. These three individuals, upon leaving government, re-entered the private sector and are alleged to have cashed in on the moderate rehabilitation program, receiving a vastly disproportionate share of the units awarded by HUD. While there is nothing per se wrong with former HUD officials benefiting from a program upon leaving government service, the question we hope to have answered today is whether their success resulted from what they knew or whom they knew, or perhaps a combination of the two. Our next hearing will be a week from today, Thursday, June 29, where our witnesses will be Mr. Frederick Bush, who is being recalled to testify about a $268,000 technical assistance grant that his firm received over the objections of career HUD employees. Mr. William Connolly, the Director of Housing of the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, and Mr. Hunter Cushing, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing. The Chair would also like to indicate this is a very heavy legislative day in the Congress, and unfortunately we will have a number of interruptions when hopefully very brief recesses will need to be taken. Congressman Kyle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no statement, but uh, would like to reiterate that this is a very uh, heavy legislative day. I will have markup in armed services and we'll have to leave uh, after a while, but we'll be here as long as I possibly can. I appreciate it. Congressman Frank. Congressman Chase. We will then hear from our first witness, Mr. Joseph Strauss, uh, former Special Assistant to the Secretary of Department of Housing and Urban Development. Mr. Strauss, will you come up to the witness table, please? If you raise your right hand, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. For the record, would you identify the gentleman who is accompanying you? <clears throat> yes, sir. That's Mr. Terence O'Donnell, counsel. We're happy to see you, Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If you'll pull the mic very close to yourself, Ms. Strauss. Yes, sir. Your entire written statement will be entered into the record. You may proceed in your own way. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Please as... Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, as you are aware, I have met with some of the members of the committee and its staff. I know that there are many important areas that the committee wishes to cover with me. Therefore, <clears throat> I have decided to waive an opening statement and go right ahead with your questions. I hope you will understand, however, that my involvement with HUD dates back some eight years. During that time, I have worked with hundreds of people, had thousands of conversations, and reviewed endless documentation. I want you to know that in preparation for hearing, for this hearing, even with the help of counsel, I have not had an opportunity to go over and review all of the information that might be available to me. I will do my very best, however, to answer the committee's questions completely and accurately. And where my recollection is not good, I will try and point that out to you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Strauss, uh, the committee has been meticulously solicitous of uh, uh, witnesses uh, in terms of uh, vast number of specific questions uh, that they may not have uh, specific answers for and, and we shall certainly treat you in a, in a similar fashion. Will you first outline for us the totality of your involvement with HUD beginning with your first employment at HUD. You're speaking of the period of my employment? Your entire period of association with the Department of Housing Urban uh, Development. I began employment at the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the position of Special Assistant to the Secretary in May of 1981. I continued there for two years, leaving in May of 1983. Uh, during that entire time, I was in the position of Special Assistant to the Secretary. To be Special Assistant to a Cabinet Secretary is a very high-level 
appointment. How did you obtain that appointment? I met uh, Secretary Pierce and some of the other officials who later ended up working at HUD in the 1980 Reagan campaign. I had a position in it with a group called uh, Ballot Security in New York. Ballot Security? Ballot, voting Ballot Security, sir. Uh, my responsibilities there were essentially to have an overview of the, uh, the balloting arrangements and the actual election day uh, voting uh, on November 4th. And during that, uh, that time, I met uh, very briefly Secretary Pierce, uh, an individual named Lance Wilson, uh, had an opportunity to work with, named Lance Wilson. I had an opportunity to work with Mr. Wilson uh, in that endeavor. And later, while I was looking at other possible positions in Washington, the, uh, the secretary was then appointed as secretary. Uh, Lance Wilson was appointed as his executive assistant. And they called me down for interviews, which I had with the secretary, and he chose me for the position. What were your specific responsibilities as special assistant? Well, I had several diverse areas of responsibility. The three largest areas, my primary responsibilities over the whole two-year period, and, it, and it, it fluctuated. They didn't all start in the beginning and all end at the end. They overlapped a little bit. Firstly, uh, I had to give the secretary input and feedback as it related to the immigration and refugee policy uh, enacted into law in 1981 in this country as it uh, related to HUD. The, the uh, White House was looking for specific impact and recommendations as the, on those impacts as they related to the agency. And that, was a, that took up a significant portion of my time. The second major area was one which was uh, somewhat self-initiated, as my job description allowed. And that was my involvement in an area known as transfers of physical assets, which is a uh, program within HUD that enables the agency to take a project which is in foreclosure or has already been foreclosed and has been assigned to the secretary and get it out of the, of the department. That is, there are no subsidies usually still attached to these things. And at the time that I began my employment at HUD, there was a tremendous emphasis by the secretary on the efforts of debt collection. One of the problems that, that the department had in great disarray was maintenance of its mortgage portfolio. We discovered that there's a vault on the sixth floor of the building that was at that time stacked with mortgage notes. The door was left open all the time. The agency had literally no idea what projects it owned, much less how to collect then on the mortgages or who was delinquent, et cetera, et cetera. So, I saw that as an opportunity for me to get involved with the career staff and work towards resolving that problem. I discussed my ideas with the secretary. He concurred that it was a worthwhile uh, and a very important thing to do to get this, this process in order. I assembled a group of, of career staff, five or six attorneys out of the general counsel's office, and five or six individuals, and I'm approximating, sir, out of the housing division, again, all career appointees, <clears throat> and people who I developed over time a great deal of respect for in terms of their enforcement mindedness and their trying to make sure that the federal government was not, uh, was not taken or was, was treated properly in its disposition of these assets. We had meetings, many, many meetings over a series of this two-year period, and I tried to act as a catalyst from the secretary's office, offering encouragement, uh, sitting in on their various meetings, looking at the uh, profile of the way that they felt this needed to be handled. And it resulted, sometime prior to my leaving the department, in the application of a formal process, which had not existed before, certainly had not existed in that way, whereby owners could be tracked, their payments could be tracked, and there was, was going to be a consistent approach taken in all cases when a developer would come into the agency, ins agency instead of a haphazard approach, one deal having been made with one individual in one part of the country being different than another. And it was our feeling, and I think it's true, that as these rules were disseminated out to the public and the public began to have an awareness that there was, in fact, these consistent uh, application of rules, they would come in with better proposals and there would be the negotiating the used car sales type 
activity would, would end and we would be able to apply a consistent policy to this. That was the second major area of my responsibility. <clears throat> I can go into that more if you'd like, but uh, the third area, major area of responsibility dealt with the Federal Emergency Management Agency and continuity of government operations. And I, I can tell you just, and that is an overview, but that work was classified as top secret and above, and I'm obviously precluded from discussing a lot of the nature of it, but it did take up a, a lot of my time there. In, in addition, in, in addition, Congressman, I just want, don't want to leave this out. I had some daily activities on a uh, sort of an ad hoc basis where letters might come into the secretary or a particular problem might arise or I might be directed by the secretary to uh, write a response to, a, to a, uh, an individual citizen's type complaint about HUD or a congressman or senator's type complaint about HUD or, or in interfacing in that, in that fashion. I did not have any program responsibility whatsoever. Well, maybe later on my colleagues or I will probe how this apparent rationalization and streamlining and the establishment of objective nationwide criteria has degenerated into what Mr. Kemp calls a swamp and total lack of management uh, controls. Describe, if you will, uh, Ms. Strauss, as candidly and as succinctly as you can, the Secretary's management style. As you know, much of this uh, investigation revolves around the question of who, in fact, was in charge at HUD. To what extent did the Secretary delegate authority? To what extent did he follow up on whether the people to whom he delegated authority carried out their responsibilities? accurately in, in, a, in line with his uh, directives. Um, describe the operation of the office. Okay, understand please that this is the perspective of a 24 year old coming into government and being somewhat awed by what was going on around you me. You were 24 years old when you <clears throat> became special assistant. I, I believe so, sir. Okay. In the areas in which... What previous experience did you have in the field of housing, by the way? Well, I had graduated law school and I, I, had, uh, I did not have any specific experience in housing whatsoever. So you, you went to college and you got a law degree? And I got a law degree and I had a fairly extensive investigative background. I had been assigned by the New York State Select Committee on Crime to the U.S. Justice Department Organized Crime Strike Force in the Southern District of New York, Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, Weld County District Attorney's Office in Colorado. And as, as I recall, sir, and it's a little bit vague in my mind, the initial press release that the department issued when I came there said that, uh, which was issued out of the secretary's office, said that uh, part of the initial feelings as to what some of my responsibilities might be would be interaction with the inspector general of HUD. Uh, and in fact, I did have some of those kinds of interactions. I did work with the inspector general from time to time while I was in the department. Right, but for the record, you had no prior housing experience. No, sir. Okay, please, please go ahead and answer the question then. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> as to, s I found Secretary Pierce in his relationship with me to be an honest, forthright individual in the three areas which I have mentioned to you. And they were somewhat out of, I think, the mainstream HUD uh, activities to a certain extent. Uh, there were initial presentations made by me to the secretary or by he to me regarding the objectives of, of what I was working on. There was fairly frequent follow-up on what I was doing. I would estimate that I met with the secretary on the average of perhaps at points once and twice a week in addition to going to senior staff meetings and the regular uh, departmental type activities. Uh, and I found him in those areas that I worked to be aware of what I was doing to be aware of what I felt the importance of what I was doing uh, was. Uh, but generally, I would classify him as a somewhat laissez-faire manager to the extent that he uh, gave me a, a problem of, uh, and, and said, run with it. Do, it. do what you can do to make this a better system. Get input from the appropriate people, uh, i.e. General Counsel's Office, Department of Hous Division of Housing, et cetera, 
and, and report back to me on a regular basis on your progress. During the period you served as special assistant to the secretary, how many special assistants did he have? To the best of my recollection, it ranged between three and, and possibly six. I believe at that time there was no, there's a, a position called, uh, I think, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian and Alaska Native Programs. They were having a hard time filling that job, so they had special assistants who were brought. Uh, was there any hierarchy among these three to six special assistants? Not, no, sir. There was no hierarchy. And each of you reported directly to the secretary? To my knowledge, sir, yes. Let me uh, come to specific projects uh, which entailed your involvement. Uh, describe for us, if you will, your relationship with Secretary James Watt, in former Interior Secretary James Watt. My, uh, my relationship with James Watt began sometime in early 1984, to the best of my recollection, I would say the month of February. I met uh, James Watt through a mutual friend. Uh, Watt at that time had office space in the same building as the friend. Who was that person? Mark Holtzman. He was then uh, director of uh, Citizens for America, which is a grassroots lobbying organization. I think they were located in the Heritage Building. Uh, Holtzman introduced me to James Watt. His position was what? Director of? Executive Director, I believe. Of? Citizens for America. What was Citizens for America? A grassroots uh, lobbying organization, uh, Republican group, conservative. Okay. Uh, I met, uh, I had the opportunity to meet James Watt and get involved in a series of discussions with him. He expressed to me the fact that he was thinking about doing various things in Washington, non-specific, but I think law firm oriented type activities. Uh, I felt that there was an opportunity for us possibly to join forces. At that point, I had established Phoenix Associates, which I, I guess we'll get into, but at that point I had established a company with technicians, attorneys. Uh, you've spoken to one of the technicians who I had retained early on, my partner. Uh, uh, and. I thought that we might join forces, and I had been having some real problems in my activities at HUD in terms of getting any response from the agency on a timely basis, in a quality basis, and in a fair basis. I felt real, real problems there. Well, let, me, let me stop you there for a second. You are a 24-year-old young man. 26 at this well, point. Well, when you, when you join HUD. Right barely out of college and law school. Yes, sir. And you are thrust into a pretty high-powered position. You are special assistant to one of the cabinet secretaries of a, of a new administration. Um, you stay with that job for two years, May 81, May 83. And you are telling us um, a story of job satisfaction, really. I mean, you, you claim to have instituted uh, new procedures that, uh, that reorganized things in a much better, more efficient, functioning fashion. Yes, sir. And how uh, you, you are now 26 yes, sir. Uh, in May of 1983. Did you leave HUD of your own volition? Were you asked to leave? And if you left of your own volition, why did you do so? I perceive during my last year or so at HUD, that there was a niche in the private sector for an individual who had an understanding of HUD programs, specifically how they worked. And since I didn't believe any one individual had all of that knowledge, I felt that if I could assemble a team of professionals, that is lawyers, technicians, people with really in, in significant housing experience and, and, and specific UDAG experience and experience in the other programs that I wanted to work, I could represent clients before that agency uh, and probably do it in a manner that would be hopefully better for the agency and, and, and better for the clients. So what you tried to do was to put together a group of housing professionals who could do a competent job in working with HUD on a variety of housing projects. Is that correct? I, I hope more than competent. 
I hope more than simply competent. I really made a strong effort to get the what I felt were the best people available to me in the country. And I'm not discussing Secretary Watt right. here. I'm right. talking about technicians and All right. Attorneys. Let me let me accept that at face value. You put together a top notch team of housing specialists <coughs> who were uniquely qualified to deal with HUD. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, sir. Well, let me stipulate, and certainly the record of your company indicates it was a financially very successful operation for a 26-year-old young man. You made a great deal of money in dealing with HUD. Um, did you view Secretary Watt as uh, fitting into that team of top-notch housing specialists? No, sir, not at all. Well, in what context did you wish to have him employed by you? I felt that based upon his stature and influence and general recognition, it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity for me at that age to bring credibility to my business by being associated with a former cabinet a member, at the same time to enhance my ability to bring in clients because people <coughs> would... But what was his stature in the housing field? None in the housing field. This was not specifically related to mm -hmm. housing, sir. It was an overall... I certainly did have in mind at the time that he would help us or might be able to help us within the Department of Housing and Urban Development, but my real overall reasons were much broader than that in bringing him in. They were to bring in additional clients having nothing to do with the housing business. I felt that uh, the nation, he was, he was, a, he was a, a recognized name, he was a former cabinet man, and it would be a sort of a two-way street. I would hope that he would have brought in business to me in terms of new clients and that I would be able to to uh, to get into other areas that had nothing to do Did with Did you contemplate housing. using his services vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis Secretary Pierce? No, not as an individual, sir. Not not as an individual at the time that I hired him. And sir, I, I so much has been made obviously of the Watt But let me let me pursue that if I may. <clears throat> you did in fact subsequently use him in that capacity? Yes, sir. Well, since you did not contemplate it initially, did that thought occur to you later on, or did Secretary Watt suggest it? Well, if I could just correct one thing you've said. Please. Sir. <clears throat> when I uh, re I didn't hire Secretary Watt. I may, I may misspeak from time to time because I'm a little bit nervous, but I retained Secretary Watt under a, a retention letter which I have found and have with me, and I've brought copies for we the committee. We would like a copy of that, if we may. And uh, if we, we might this give that to you, because I don't want to read from something that you're not reading from. I don't want to read anything out of context or, or, or not properly, so. <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, read slow. I'm sorry. Read slow, we'll keep up. Yeah, we'll, we'll. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think we gave it a second. Can I just wait until you all have a copy of this? So just go ahead. Okay. This is a letter from uh, me to James Watt, uh, dated March 12, 1984. And I would like to point out for the record that this was written approximately a month or so after we uh, met with James Watt. And it was written at his request. He felt that he wanted to have some memorialization in writing of our general agreements. I'd like to, to read at least part of this for you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Dear Jim, as you know... I, I, I really think, for sake of brevity, try to read the, the portions which are relevant, and I don't okay. think the entire letter is... The, the first paragraph, perhaps, is not, but, but, but it gets very relevant very quickly. Okay. In each of the above-listed cases, and I have, as you can see in the top right-hand corner, specific projects, Phoenix has been retained by a private sector developer client as their Washington-based consultant. In each instance, there exists a situation where the U.S. Department of HUD, its officials, employees, staff, or executive branch appointees have repeatedly failed to honor their promises and representations. In each instance, our client has met or exceeded HUD's technical requirements or has requested reasonable waivers to allow an acceptable incentive to the private developer to meet the public's need for safe, sanitary, and affordable government-assisted housing. Phoenix has devoted many months of concentrated effort to each case, along with the efforts <clears throat> and resources of each individual client. Yet HUD has acted in an inconsistent, uninformed, and arbitrary manner, 
to the point where legal claims of misfeasance, or worse, might soon be made against the agency by these clients. We believe your expertise and experience in administrative law and procedure as a former cabinet secretary and respected member of the bar is valuable to our clients and to Phoenix. Although it might be possible to calculate the hours of your effort required in each instance and set your compensation on that basis, doing so poses problems for each of us. Phoenix cannot undertake an open-ended retention of your services without regard to success, as we have been retained in these matters on a contingent or substantially contingent basis. Further, in each situation, the client is at the point of total frustration and would be disinclined to agree to an open-ended hourly retention without a strong assurance or guarantee of ultimate success. Given HUD's recent record, Phoenix such, uh, I'm sorry, such assurances or guarantees will not be made by Phoenix. On the other hand, you supply us not only with the actual hours of effort, but with a lifetime of experience, a finely tuned sense of what government agencies can and cannot accomplish within the bounds of the law, and a well-developed flair for innovation, often critical to success. Therefore, to balance the competing factors discussed herein, and in, our, and in our many enjoyable conversations. Could I stop you with that well-developed flair for innovation? <laughs> because that's a little rich. Uh, that's a little rich. What particularly were you looking for in Mr. Watts' well-developed flair of innovation to help you with? Architectural flair? No, no, sir. This is not Interior decorating no. flair? landscape architecture flair, what, what was that well-developed flair for innovation that you were trying to buy? The level of consideration that we could rise to within the agency. Mr. Strauss, you, you are under oath. You are under oath, and this committee is enormously patient. This is a very flowery letter. This is a very colorful letter. What this letter tells me in plain English, and you correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the phrase well-developed flair for innovation uh, uh, just got beyond the line of, of one's patience. You hired him to use his influence at HUD to help you push through your projects. Is that what this letter says in English? That's what this letter says. Okay, well then let's not read the well-developed flair for innovation business because we're wasting the committee's time. You are testifying that you did not use Mr. Watt for any technical knowledge in the field of housing. That's correct? correct. That is correct, sir. You did not use him for any understanding of HUD because he was never near HUD. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. He may never have been in that building prior to your hiring him. Is that correct? That's possible, sir. The chances are he was never inside the building. You hired him <coughs> to peddle his influence with Sam Pierce to get you these projects. Is that correct? While I think influence peddling is a pejorative term, I do agree. It is I a descriptive agree, term. It is a descriptive term. And in this sense, the description is correct. The description is correct. Uh, what I find interesting in your letter, and this is the first time I've glanced at it, is that you are making a blanket condemnation of all HUD officials, employees, staff, etc. This is what you're saying. No, sir. Well, let me read it to you. You are saying, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm I'm going to read your own letter. In each of the above listed cases, Phoenix, which is your company, has been retained by a private sector developer client as their Washington-based consultant. In each instance, there exists a situation where the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, its officials, employees, staff, or executive branch appointees, I repeat, its officials, employees, 
staff, or executive branch appointees have repeatedly failed to honor their promises and representations. Well, this is about as blanket an indictment as you could concoct. You're saying that the executive branch appointees, the officials, the employees, staff, every instance fail to honor their promises and representations. Therefore, you are turning to Mr. Watt to help you. Now, you surely did not expect him to talk to low-level employees. You didn't expect him to talk to uh, anybody in the middle echelons. You expected him to go to the top. Isn't that correct? If necessary, yes, sir. But I did not have a particular expectation that he would need to go to the top in these cases. And I would like to correct one thing that you've said Please. for the record, if I might. Please. I have the highest regard for most of the career staff that I dealt with at HUD. And it doesn't seem from well, this letter. Well, I'm saying to you, sir, that I had very specific, demonstrable, documented problems wherein we were fitting well within the HUD rules and regulations, and we were having a very difficult time with, with uh, phone calls being answered, with, uh, with meetings being held, with, with misquotes of their own rules and regulations being made at meetings. And it became apparent that in some cases, there was a real uh, gap that needed to be bridged, sir. And I say that from a technical basis on these projects. It does not mean in every case. In, in many cases, as we'll uh, discover later, Secretary Watt's services were not used at all in any capacity. There was no reason to. HUD was... Mr. Strauss, you can't have it both ways. You started out your testimony under oath by saying that you gathered this very competent, dedicated, wonderful group of HUD employees, and with their help, you reorganized your sphere of activity. Isn't that true? I organized my sphere, yes. Right. Yes. Now you leave HUD, and now you work with HUD. And you write a letter to Mr. Watt employing him. You presumably think this is a <clears throat> useful letter in terms of your own testimony because you're introducing it. The committee didn't. I didn't know there was such a letter. And you offer a blanket condemnation of, and you're very precise. You say, HUD officials, employees, staff, and executive branch appointees. The whole works. Um, did this all happen because you left? I mean, prior to your leaving HUD, they were all hardworking, wonderful people that you enjoyed creating good uh, management systems with. And when you left, they suddenly became an, uh, people who broke their promises and representations? No, sir. I don't think that's a fair characterization. Some people. This is a very subtle feeling that I'm trying to convey to you, and I, I this, I'm just trying to tell you the truth as I saw it and what I felt at the time and, and still feel now. <clears throat> there were people at, at the agency who I felt, because they would see an individual from the private sector on a regular basis, seemed to have a feeling, and this, and this would, would, would transcend career, political, et cetera, yeah. that if, they, if you were there frequently, if you were there three times instead of one time, then you must be making three times as much money as one times as much money. And there seemed to be some correlation in, in people's decision-making minds as to uh, the frequency with which someone was seen, et cetera. And it, it, I honestly and sincerely believe that in every case that I was at HUD or that my partners represented people at HUD, we were, we were uh, in a very sincere position, in a demonstrable position, to debate, to show the reasons we were there. And I, and I felt like, like we were handling those cases in that fashion, sir. I, I, I did not mean this, regardless of how it's being read now. At the time, I did you not wrote, mean this as a blanket. I, but I, did, I did not mean this as a blanket indictment, sir. All right. Uh, we have just had bells for the vote, and the committee will stand in recess for a brief period. Yeah. Yeah. Strauss, we interrupted you, so please proceed with any additional comments you wish to make concerning this letter. Just one, Congressman. I just want to state so there's no misunderstanding. And again, I appear here before you voluntarily. What I tell you is, is my best feeling and my most sincere feeling and everything that I'm saying. And that on the four projects that were cited in the Watt letter, I felt 
that we were not getting fair consideration. For whatever the reason was, that, and I never mean to impute the reputation generally of the HUD career staff. In fact, the political staff was, I don't want to hand out uh, point percentages, but was equally guilty of, uh, and, and we point that out in the letter too, of, of those things. And I make no bones, Congressman, about the fact that the reason that James Watt was hired, was retained, that we went into an association with him, was not because of his housing knowledge or his technical knowledge or of his legal skills, which, which may in fact be there, but that was not the reason. Uh, the reason was because of his access and his influence. And I, and I don't want to make any bones about that. And I don't want to, to sidestep or dance or any, anything like that. I want to answer your question. Let me ask you a question. You were one of a handful of people who was a special assistant to Secretary Pierce. You testified, you saw him regularly, both alone, I take it, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yes, sir. And in senior staff meetings. And, and others, and other sub-components. Other sub-components. Um, you knew many other people at HUD. Yes, sir. Why didn't you use your own connections at HUD to well, lubricate things? To some extent, sir, I did. In certain projects, I represented personally uh, many of the TPAs, some mod rehab, some UDAG, although UDAG was primarily our UDAG staffers. I did do that. The, uh, pr when I left the agency, it was my judgment that the one person I did not really want to deal with after I left was the secretary. And I made that decision at the time because I felt that it would uh, that it would uh, uh, maybe be an imposition on his on his uh, relationship with me and a combination of uh, that it, it would not look seemly and it, of course in 2020 hindsight I I, uh, Did it I don't know whether seemly? my judgment was Did it look more seemly to have the former Secretary of the Interior go in on your behalf? At that age, at that time in my life, it, it appeared that way to me. And, and, and was, was it your impression that Mr. Watt was going to make these decisions, that, that nobody at a level below him could have helped you whom you knew? I'm not sure I understand the no, Mr. Pierce. Oh, uh, well, originally, and this is the case, Congressman, that uh, the initial intentions at the time of the writing of this letter were not for Pierce to go to the secretary particularly, although that was an option if necessary. And in fact, on a number of these, first of all, the first three of these are not even mod rehab projects. I just want to point that out to you because we haven't really gone through it. And <clears throat> we felt that we needed, Mr. Chairman, great attention. It seemed that a problem that continually happened with HUD was was not getting attention. And I don't mean just That's being not forgotten. That's what you're saying in your letter. You say they broke their promises and representations. That's true. That's true. In these cases, So it's that not the true. lack of attention you are complaining about, but that they Well, the lack of appropriate attention. The lack of appropriate attention, sir. In other words, in the first project here, just to give you an example, we start this project in approximately early, uh, mid-1983 after I've left HUD. And we work it and work it and work it. And we have tens and tens of meetings with the career staff. Sometimes there were political people at HUD, uh, General uh, DA, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing, who would have been in charge of the people that were there, appearing at those meetings. And we would continually get responses, and some in writing, sir, that said, this is a good proposal, this is a feasible proposal, this meets all of the HUD requirements, we'll give you an answer in five days. A month would go by get another similar letter. Another two months would go by, get another similar letter. Another three months would go by, get another similar letter. And from sometimes different groups of people. So you'd get an approval from one group, and then they'd bounce it up or bounce it laterally or bounce it down to another group. And, and that was a, a, a continuing problem for us. And this letter was written in some degree of frustration, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. There was a written contract under which uh, developer, Ms. Judith Siegel, agreed to pay James Watt $300,000 for securing Section 8 rent subsidy funds from HUD for a project in Essex, Maryland. 
You're familiar with that project? Y yes, I am, sir. Can you explain why Ms. Siegel sent the check for $169,000 to Mr. Watt and sent the balance $131,000 to your company? Y yes, sir, I think I can. Do this very carefully because the committee has probed Mr. Watt on that and I'm not sure we have gotten satisfactory responses. Okay, uh, and I don't know what Mr. Watt's recollection in, on this is, but I will tell you my own recollection. Uh, we agreed, first of all, to understand the context. This project in Essex, Maryland was located by my company, by Judith Siegel and by fee finders that we had working with us in 1983, approximately six, seven, eight months before we began to work with Watt and signed this retainer letter agreement with him. We had, I was at that point paying my partner on a retainer basis, a significant amount of money per year. We had gotten an assistant an attorney to work with her on staff full time, two secretaries, all of the travel, the reference documents, the seminars, because we were learning, sir, also as we we're going along. We we're attending tax seminars, housing seminars, multifamily seminars. I paid all of those expenses, Phoenix paid those. And the project had already been, I think, as you know, submitted as a Section 8 application and had fallen by the wayside. It had not been funded. And while the state of Maryland was very much behind it, there was no nothing much had happened. So we, we generated that project. We, we uh, created a matrix on that project. We did a punch list, physical construction punch list of the, of the in other words, the project continued to degenerate during these, these intervening years, so it required a significant amount of technical expertise to, to make something out of this. At a later point, after we hired Watt, in early 1986 was when the application went forward again to the department. So that this project was discovered by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, my partner at a cost, significant cost, to my company. We had had a number of meetings with the owners. We had physically visited the project. Right. We had ar architects and engineers that had been on site. We had brought in legal staff to do a feasibility analysis. We had gone to the state to see if the tax credits would be, if the state would be willing to uh, be forthcoming with tax credits. And, and I want to point out something else. My partner had done a considerable. When you say your partner, Judith be, Siegel, yes, had done a considerable amount of work with the state. Uh, which, which essentially could be translated into, if you feel so strongly about this project, State of Maryland, if it is really such a top item for you, in your opinion, to, then you should be willing to put state money in with the federal money. You should be willing to give your own subsidies. And that, this is very limited money, secondary let me, financing. Let me stop money. you a moment. If, if you were, you, you keep referring to Ms. Siegel as your partner. Why didn't she have a contract with you? Why did she have a contract with Mr. She did Watt? have a contract with me for the time. Uh, well, we have a draft contract. I don't know if it's a formal contract that delineated our relationship from the beginning. But I wanted to give you the context from which this project right. arose as to, as to why the facts I'm giving you now will make sense. But on this particular project, the contract was between her yes, and Mr. Watt. Yes, sir. Although in point of fact, you were her partner. Is that I, your I, I was her partner on a number of things at the time. But not on this. No, on, on this, I was her partner. Is there an executed contract to that effect? On this project, no. Yes. No. Well, in what context were you then a partner? In the same way I was in all other projects. With her, I had no other contracts. Mm -hmm. this, was not a, this was not a unique situation, mm -hmm. sir, where there was no contract. I trust <coughs> my partner, Judith Siegel, implicitly. I would do many projects or deals with her or business arrangements on a handshake. Mm -hmm. Because I would trust her to pay me at the appropriate time and in the appropriate amount. And, and I guess, uh, and, I, and I still believe that. I still believe that she's a very honest person and that she would do that. And that was the somewhat casual, I guess, nature of my relationship with her. But, but in any event, to answer your question. You're, well, let me pursue this because this is interesting. You're, you're testifying that your business relationship with Ms. Siegel was basically on a handshake basis. Uh, yes, all There was right. mutual confidence. Yes. But neither of you had a handshake relationship with Mr. Watt. Each of you had a contract with Mr. Watt. I would have had a handshake relationship with Mr. Watt. I did in the beginning, but he re requested of me a memorialization in writing of what we had talked about. That was his nature. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <clears throat>
because I had gone to the great out-of-pocket expense in locating the project, working up the matrix on it, doing all the things that I just enumerated to you. Uh, at the time Jim Watt signed his contract with Judy Siegel or vice versa, I was taking a little bit less of an active role in these kinds of things. We're now into 1986, so in early 1986, I believe. So my uh, knowledge was that, in fact, the rate to be paid by Ms. Siegel on a project like this, based on my experience, was $300,000. It was roughly $1,000 a unit. It was a rough, roughly a 300-unit project, therefore $300,000. And that she was aware that I would be sharing in the proceeds of this project based upon the work that I had done and the out-of-pocket money I had laid out and the time that we had spent on this project with Watt, although she did not know the details of that. I believe she assumed, I think that she has stated, that she knew I was somehow involved with him financially, but she didn't know the details of it. And the details are as follows. I had agreed prior to that time that if Jim Watt went ahead with a project with Judy Siegel, and it was one that was developed under the Phoenix umbrella, if you will, in the beginning, that we would split 50-50 the proceeds he was going to receive on that. And for that, then, I was doing, in essence, two things. On the minimal side, I was briefing Secretary Watt, which was, a, I would say, at the most, a matter of two weeks, maybe four hours a day. I'm, I'm really going back far in my memory here. But it was a relatively minimal amount of time. And then keep him updated on the nature of the project. Watt, Jim Watt seemed to have a, a tremendous desire, a demand he made of us, to keep him technically aware of project-related information, I think because he felt that he might be taken to task on this, or that at a meeting with uh, Secretary Pierce or whomever, someone would say, well, why this project? Why this state? Why this public housing authority? Uh, um, and, and I don't, uh, well, that was, his, that was his attitude, and that was the, the one side of what I was doing. But the much greater side of what I was doing was, was the work I had done to that point with Ms. Siegel, and then subsequent work after. Syndication analysis on this project was extensive. We went to more than one syndicator, met with them, looked at the amount of basis points paid. We looked carefully at, the, uh, at whether or not letters of credit versus lump sum payments would be applied to this project, that the divisional pays. In other words, in syndication, it could be a one, two, three, four, or fractional amount of pays. So there's a time value of money calculation that needs to be done. All of those activities I did with Judith Siegel. And consequently, the general arrangement was, the specific arrangement with Watt was we would split the fee, which would be $150,000 a piece. Siegel was generally aware that I would be getting some amount of the fee. She had signed that contract with Watt, so I presume she felt comfortable in paying that amount as an overall lump sum. Simultaneously, uh, Phoenix Corporation on other projects, and I, I will go through our whole relationship with Jim Watt with you at whatever point you want to, but we had owed as a corporation, we owed James Watts Corporation for his assistance in other projects, $19,000. One of the projects of that $19,000 was the project which has been mentioned in New Haven, Connecticut, which had nothing to do with HUD. It was not a Section 8 deal. It didn't go ahead to fruition, but we did receive a retainer from the client on that project because we went up to New Haven. We met with architects, the city. We were designated the preferred developer. Watt attended with us that uh, that set of meetings. He went to the site with us, et cetera. So even though the project didn't go to fruition, uh, Judith Siegel got $5,000, I got $5,000, Jim Watt got $5,000 from a $15,000 retainer. That was, just to give you an example, 5000 of the 19000 that we owed Mr. him. Strauss, uh, Mr. Strauss, Mr. Watt testified that in early 1985, he met with Secretary Pierce to discuss a project in Puerto Rico. It is my understanding that you accompanied Mr. Watt to HUD headquarters, but didn't attend the meeting with Secretary Pierce. Is that correct? It may be, but I don't recollect. I know that I was not at a meeting like that. Do you recall what Mr. Watt was lobbying Mr. Pierce for with respect to Puerto Rico? Yes, sir. Uh, similar. Can you tell us succinctly what that was? Similar to the Maryland project, Secretary Pierce wa uh, oh, and of course I wasn't at the meeting, but what we briefed Secretary Watt on and what we expected him to tell Secretary Pierce was that 
uh, the island of Puerto Rico, which, uh, of, of which 62 percent of the entire Commonwealth is below the United States national poverty limit and is on food stamps, and by any objective criteria is greatly in need of some amount of assistance. And of course, the fair share regulations had, depending on how you want to look at it, we felt had, had been suspended, the nation seemed to feel had been suspended. And we felt that it was a golden opportunity. There were, there, under the 1974 National Housing Act and Community Development Act of 1974, there are five criteria, which I don't think have been discussed in front of the committee yet, but are very, very relevant and have been applied during the fair share years and then later in the, in the years after what the I, Inspector General calls the significant changes were made within the program. That was, in essence, the reestablishment or the reuse of these five very important criteria. Puerto Rico fit all five. In a big way, it fit all five. So it was an opportunity to do uh, projects in a place where uh, you have a, an opportunity to, Strauss, to meet the end. Your company hired other individuals also <coughs> to lubricate projects at HUD. Uh, yes, was, sir. Was Mr. Watt the only one? No, he was not the only one. What other individuals did you hire to uh, push your projects at HUD? Uh, the, the ones that come to mind off hand, sir, are Jarris Leonard, attorney in Washington, Tom what Evan. What did he do for you? Uh, he did the same thing as Mr. Watt. He would call the agency. I don't know who he met with uh, specifically, but he would, he would uh, uh, and I don't believe it was the secretary, but I'm not sure. Uh, mm. He would uh, go to HUD on our behalf. He would find out what intelligence uh, information was to, to be found. He would uh, ask about when a funding round might occur. He would, uh, he would, Couldn't you he find would extol this the virtues of the by project. yourself, all of these items? Uh, yes, sir, but when it came to getting fair consideration in a, in a program which I knew, without knowing the specifics, I knew generally in the street. It was a widely known and widely accepted, if I could use that word for this conversation, fact that there were what I would call very heavy hitter political consultants regularly involved in this program. And all I wanted was fair consideration because I tell you now, Congressman, in every bit of sincerity, I would put up our projects against anyone's projects in the United States. Now, I'm not going to tell you we would always win. Of course, we wouldn't always win. But we would certainly be up there in the rankings, sir, both by the objective criteria that the program is, is evaluated by Congress, that is these five criteria, and the specifics of that particular project. Is it your testimony that you had outstanding projects, but without these very heavy hitters, you couldn't have the projects approved? That's what I felt, sir, yes. Please. Did anyone ever bring to you a project and you turned it down because it didn't live up to your high standards? Absolutely, sir. The, we, we've been trying to look through the records and to the best of our ability now, and of course, if someone came and it was a real slipshod type thing or we really couldn't do it, we wouldn't really save much of that, but it appears that the ratio was about four to one. That you is, would have a list of some of these that you turned yes, out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And in addition, uh, ones that might have gotten funded, but then the funding never went to us. In other words, there was a NOFA run, and for whatever reason, the local housing authority made a decision that we were not the best uh, uh, person. In fact, in some cases, we were number two, but number one got it. It wasn't us. What other heavy hitters did you employ? Uh, I, I w Watt it would be the only one I think would classify as a heavy hitter. What I was saying to you is I was aware mm -hmm. on a national basis, mm -hmm. this is what, if we wanted to be in this business, we were up against, so to speak. We were up against what I consider very, very powerful people. And, I, and, and it was just, it was, it, was, it was known, I mean. Whom else did you employ to push your project? <clears throat> uh, Jarris Leonard, who I told you, Tom Evans. Uh, of the of the Manat firm, I believe, uh, Mark Holtzman helped us on a one project, I believe. Uh, David Carmen helped us on one project. The son of Can you describe that project and what Mr. Carmen's responsibility was? Uh, his responsibility was to try and get the attention of HUD. Uh, again, the fair consideration oh, given to uh, the project was in Puerto Rico, and I would just have to look at my records to give you the. A specific one, but that was it. The was fee it successful? Uh, yes, that that was successful. What was Mr. Carmen's fee? Twenty-five thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And to the best of your knowledge, what work did he perform for that? He would have lobbied, or influenced, or contacted HUD on yeah. our behalf. Yeah. I don't know. 
We did it not, we told him again, the virtues of the project. He was chosen by us because I believed he had much better contacts than I did. But you strike I, 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 I yeah. just want you to understand, I am not a major contributor, I am not a fundraiser, I am not, I don't know, maybe major isn't even appropriate, I'm not even been a minor contributor really. I don't think I've, other than one personal friend who's run for Congress who I really like and respect and I would have supported him no matter what party he ran on, I don't think we've given more than $250 donation to, to anyone in Are you in, suggesting politics. you had to be a major contributor to get projects approved? I think that, I think that people who were politically known, who were whatever you would, however you might use the word influential in this town, had an absolute entree in the way that this program was being run. And that's what I think was bad about this program. Because if I had had an opportunity in some way to participate and not be looked at from po politics at all, again, we wouldn't have won them all, but if we put in 100, we might have won 50 or 60 or 70. I mean, it was just a, a, a it was the methodology of going about it. It was the methodology of, of, of engendering local grassroots support. Did you hire anybody else to push projects? Uh, I don't believe so. I think that's... Does the name Ben Waldman mean anything to you? Uh, yes. Did you hire him to push a project? Y yes, we did. Could we you tell us what the circumstances were? <clears throat> it would be the same thing. He had uh, White House experience. He was very well connected politically, but again, not at what I would call anything like the Jim Watt level. But uh, he had awareness of, uh, of uh, HUD. I think he had been, we didn't know him, but he had been employed at HUD, I think, at one point in a to the best somewhat of your junior knowledge, capacity. Did he play a role in the appointment of Mr. Tom Demery as Assistant Secretary for Housing? Not to the best of my knowledge. Not to your knowledge. To your knowledge, did he become a fundraiser for Food for Africa subsequently? I believe that he briefly, for a matter of a week or two, may have had some involvement in there, but I believe after that he went to the Robertson campaign and had no further involvement with that institution. But I say that only based on what I've read in the reports. In preparation for this hearing, did you uh, gather a list of all the projects you had which were successful with HUD? Uh, yes, sir, I think How I'll... long is that list? <clears throat> Of all projects? All projects you did with HUD. Uh, the list, well, it's fairly significant. I several think. pages. No, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I've separated onto several pages, but I can tell you totals to just give you a quick summary. Please. <clears throat> and then for the record, will you submit the detail to the subcommittee? So I would like to cooperate Thank everyone, you. sure. <clears throat> In, uh, I've got a UDAG list here. We represented 18 clients on a total of tw for a total of 26 UDAGs or UDAG-related matters, legally binding commitments, other things that were required. Okay, and, and um, I want to just say that I'm not sure these numbers are exactly precise. But, but they're I, ballpark figures. I, I hope they're better than they're ballpark. They're better than ballpark. I, I really have done an effort, really, Good. to try and... Of that, we prepared applications on 13 of those. Of these. We represented at HUD, that is, physically went into the agency, uh, on 20 of those. In other words, there were special either negotiations or contracts that had to be signed. And of those, we had six funded. A total of six mm -hmm. were successful. What was the total value of those projects? Well, in each of the cases, we took initial retainers from these clients. And then if we were actually successful going through the whole process, because the UDEG process is split into many different phases of effort, uh, we would have landmarks of other payments that were due to us. I don't know, sir, what the breakout Can is. Can you give numbers. us a ballpark on that? No, I really can't, okay. sir. Uh, then... Uh, <clears throat> you will submit that in writing when you have an opportunity to develop this. Uh, then in the transfer of physical assets area, I have a summary. We represented 15 clients. We received the retainer from each of the 15 clients, which is the way that we worked in, in all of those cases. We submitted to the agency nine workouts. Nine, in other words, the last step in the TPA process yes. is an application for a workout. Uh, we had three of them approved, and we actually only closed two of the three. And on those, because I'm sure you're interested, Jim Watt was a consultant on two. One was funded, uh, one was, this isn't a funding decision, one was approved and one was not. 
Please. Mr. Gossage, I want to know who you represented. Did you represent the ultimate buyer, or did you represent the holder who was in default? And who's uh, about, uh, breakout, Mr. Frank, uh, Congressman, would be about 90% new owners, the, maybe more. The buyers. Of buyers, the, right. You, you were not representing on the whole the person who not was Not on the whole. There were a few of those in there. But who was in default. Not usually, and, and let me just explain why, because I, I, I think it's important. When the borrower, original borrower, is in default, there are claims usually made by HUD of some impropriety on that person's behalf, and therefore, whether well, it's sometimes it's just not paying the mortgage. Well, sometimes they didn't pay anything for 10 years on the mortgage. I had a case where someone came into my office, said, here's my mortgage, here's my, I got a letter from a United States attorney telling us we're going to foreclose, they're going to foreclose on this project. The Justice Department was the entity which, which handled that for HUD. And <clears throat> how, how can we work this out? Can I give them a year's payments? Can I give them two years' payments? Can I give them three years' payments? I didn't physically throw them out of my office, but essentially I said, you're out of your mind. The first criteria that HUD is going to look at, number one, is that before you can even get paid anything to sell this to anyone, every penny of the debt has to be paid to HUD. And HUD wasn't just using the debt that started by the non-mortgage payments. They added on the security guards, the per unit per annum. Yeah. You know, okay, I just wanted to. Does that? Yeah, I just want to know who you were representing. Okay. okay. So for the most part, in those cases of TPAs, we were representing the new owners because th then you could sort of ride in on a white horse and say, <coughs> here's Mr. Clean. He hasn't anything to do with this project. These are his financials. This is what his proposal is. And here's a new contract. There was a change in the TPAs. And at some point, we began to impose restrictions. But when I first came here, HUD's effort with the transfer of physical assets just to sell them by and large and maximize their income from the sale. They were giving them away, sir. Giving them away. I mean, in other words, sometimes they would have auction process where they would take the highest bid. But on a regular basis, they got beat at those auctions because these are problem projects. It requires, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and HUD was, I think that the calculation we did when I was at the agency, sir, was three cents on the okay. dollar back to the taxpayer. Thank you with some earlier hearing to the subcommittee. That's just... Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I sort of lost my train of thought. Oh, I was telling you about TPAs. Okay. Yes. So we had uh, the three <clears throat> approved and two actually closed, Watt being a participant, a consultant in two of those. And uh, one of those was approved and closed. The other one was never approved. What or was your salary when you left HUD? Approximately, sir, $55,000 a year. 55000 Approximately. And how long were you in the business of working with HUD outside in the private sector? Uh, approximately six years. Six years. From 1983 and a half to about 19. And working with HUD, what was your... Uh, you mean my outside income? Yes, your outside earnings. <clears throat> in the first... Uh, I can give you breakout of years. The, the total I made over, over, the, over a five to six year period was approximately $950,000 personally, gross. So that it boils down to about $160,000 a year for the intervening for those years. And your company? The company uh, grossed uh, in that same period of time about $4 million. $4 million. That's correct. That's on everything, sir. That's not just HUD business or? How much of that was HUD related? Uh, I, I would say, I'm, I'm really estimating, sir, yes. I, but I'd say about 80% was HUD-related, overall HUD-related, yes. I only have two brief questions. It's my understanding that on two projects you were involved with, one of them called Four Seasons in Gastonia, North Carolina, and the other called Cityside Apartments in Trenton, New Jersey. Ms. Dean and Ms. Demery disagreed about whether to fund the project and they were approved shortly after Ms. Dean left HUD. Is that correct? I, I don't believe so, sir. I'm then fairly certain me, I'm fairly certain they were approved while she was there, but I don't know anything about disagreements between her and Mr. Demery. But timing-wise, I believe that uh, Gastonia, <clears throat> let me just check and see if I have an exact date to give you. Well, uh, when did, could you tell me when Ms. Dean left HUD? Because maybe I could just answer you more quickly that way. I'm not sure I have my dates here. 
Is it? Is I this, believe that those were funded while she was in the agency, yeah. in answer to your question. Is this the first time you have heard that there was a disagreement between those two individuals on the propriety of funding those a projects, or you knew about it? Absolutely, because it's interesting that you chose those two projects, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. One of them was uh, the Trenton project, was funded after a visit by Chris Smith, congressman, with the mayor of Trenton, with members of the town council, who all flew down to Washington, D.C., without being solicited or spoken to even by us. They had a congressional delegation go into HUD. They met with HUD officials. They extolled the virtues of the project being in the state capitol, and it was a crack house type situation, et cetera. And they, with, without me, were able to convince the agency. There was no consultant on that project. In addition, um, uh, no, we didn't, Congressman. No fee for them. No fee. None whatsoever. And frankly, I would like to do it that way all the time. <clears throat> uh, and in any event, and in Gastonia, uh, I personally t uh, looked at that application and I worked it with Judith Siegel. And I think if you look at that application, you should draw your own conclusions as to its merits, especially in, in light of all other projects that were funded at any time. Now, you have observed the moderate rehabilitation program both as a private developer and uh, inside of HUD. In, view, in your view, how could we improve the selection process? <clears throat> Do you really want me to be very specific about that? Because I have a, a specific statement to make, but it may be a little bit, well, let me, let me summarize if I might, and, and, and that might help. This is the only program by which, if the Congress is interested in rehabilitating housing that I am aware of, that will ever get to rehabilitate that housing, because it combines the government's guarantee of rents. So you disagree with Secretary Pierce, who wanted to eliminate the program? Yes, I do. I absolutely you, disagree. You agree with the previous administration that wanted to eliminate the program? I disagree with the previous administration that wanted to eliminate the program, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You think the program without the abuses is a worthwhile program. It's the only program that will get to the objective that Congress sought when they created it. Uh, if Congress just You know, Mr. Pierce testified before this committee as we were exploring these scandals that uh, he always wanted to eliminate this. And um, some of us suggested to him that maybe the programs were very worthwhile, only they were riddled with influence peddling and mismanagement, and that was the problem, not the concept. You I agree with that? I think you're absolutely right, Con Con Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. How would you improve on, on its management? <clears throat> I would attempt to remove the political decisions completely from this. I would do that by, uh, with the following method. This whole program is supposed to be demographically based. You call it fair share. I call it demographically based. HUD needs to establish a process where those demographics are accurate. In some programs, like UDAG, they wait every 10 years till there's a new census to update their info information. So you might be, in the eighth, ninth, and tenth years, be doing something that really isn't within the initial uh, <coughs> uh, ambit of what Congress intended. I would have all projects, I would publish nationally in the United States, and I would use every effort that I could to get it well known to developers, public housing authorities, participants in the program, that funding is available that it will be made available in the following amounts and in the following communities upon the fo on the following dates. I would solicit proposals by advertising from as many qualified developers as I could get. I would have the Public Housing Authority rank and rate each of those in a demonstrable uniform criteria. And there is no such criteria. There are no regulations now at HUD that really govern how the PHA makes its selection criteria. So one might say, we'll pick all the people under five feet, and uh, the others would be over five feet. So you need to have a consistent, uniform thing. So that if a developer from California wants to, for some reason, do a project in New York, he knows what the criteria are, he knows how to meet them, and he knows if he doesn't win that award, he will get at least a fair consideration, and he'll know where he rated am among the other people. Then, on a, on a limited geographical basis, that is either on a, uh, some subcomponent of a statewide basis, possibly on the PHA level, I'd put the already qualified applications that have been ranked and rated by the PHA, put the top 
ones, because you know you're not going to get very deep in the funding. There just isn't that much money that the government is putting into this program now. And I'd put them in a hat, or I'd put them in some method of drawing these out, because you know, no matter which one you picked, you've got the right area, the right amount of funding, the right subcomponent of the demographic criteria, and there's no politics involved in this at all. There's no uh, committees, there's no individual decisions, all of that is gone. And yet, you're not doing it on a national basis where, you, where some area might lose out. So, so that you're, you're hitting fairness on two levels. Fairness on the local level and fairness on the uh, selection level. And politics wouldn't play, you wouldn't know what party, if any, uh, anyone belonged to. Or if it was not on a partisan, you wouldn't know who their contacts in Washington were. Or their lawyers, for instance, wouldn't be uh, particularly important. Uh, those kinds of things, the traditional Washington lobbying set wouldn't be able to get their, their hands on it. So to paraphrase you, you would, you would establish a geographic breakout, then you would establish objective criteria, take whatever top three or five projects there are in each region, and then you would go to random selection. Yes, sir, with a, with a backup in each case. In other words, if you thought you might fund three projects in, uh, in, uh, in Manhattan, for instance, you would, you would select six. So, because uh, sometimes they <coughs> fall out, you need to understand, I understand that. that. This may be one rational way of going. There are many others, but certainly not very complex. Why during the eight years did we not get uh, any rational, clean, non-political process come out of uh, HUD? I can't answer that comment. Well, I think you can. I, I would say that if, the, if an agency doesn't do something, it's because it doesn't want to do something. You only, get, you only get an effort. I mean, you only get a, a result when you put out an effort. You only get quality when you look to get quality. Is it your testimony that the agency did not wish an orderly, objective, non-political process? Is that what you're saying? I wouldn't quite go that far, I would well, say, if they had wanted to, want to, sir, go. I would say, if, if, I would say that, that these ideas that you and I are discussing now I understand, are not, my are question not a, is, why didn't the agency implement some objective, measurable, non-political, clean system of selection? They didn't make the effort. They didn't seem to make the effort. I, I really, I wasn't there, I wasn't would part of the process when I was there. Would it be fair to say that they liked that the agency at the top level liked the process that was in place. I couldn't characterize it that way. I couldn't. I could not say to you, for instance, that Secretary Pierce liked it the way it was. I think what he testified to is... Would he have had the power to change the selection process, Mr. Stanton? Yes, he certainly would have had the he power. He had every power to change the selection process. <clears throat> yes, sir. And he didn't. Yes, sir. That Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> I have two angles I'm going to pursue. The first would be an attempt to cloak the proceedings with a greater degree of impartiality or bipartisanship or what have you. But in 1973, the American Enterprise Institute study called HUD's 235 Rehab Program an open invitation of fraud. Do you think that's an apt description of today's program? To fraud, sir? No, to mismanagement, to, uh, to that kind of thing. I don't know if I would use that as a term of art. I know you're very young, but you also are now an, an expert in housing. Do you think that describes um, uh, previous administrations? In 73, they obviously thought it uh, described the effort at that time, the system at that time. Do you think the system has improved? We're talking about the 235 program now? Or well, the we're talking about housing programs, but I start out with the 235 condemnation. Sir, in, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I'm, I, I'm a, a housing expert, but I'm not a historical housing expert. I really don't know much about what happened before me. And, and, I, and I would say this, you get what you put in. You get out the effort that you put in. You get quality based on effort. If a, this is not... Uh, the art of medicine, where we our best brains guess at the best answers. This is not like calculus. This is housing. This is poor people who need something yesterday, not tomorrow. So I, I, I think that an agency has a responsibility to deliver. Then let me move forward chronologically. In 78 editorial, significant chunk of HUD money appears to be benefiting not the poor, but the banks, private investors, consulting firms, and university researchers. 
Is that a true statement describing today's programs? I missed the first few words, sir. A significant chunk of HUD money appears to be benefiting the poor, but uh, not the poor, but the banks, private investors, consulting firms, and university <coughs> researchers. That I think a, that, today's I think program? That's, that, that's probably fair in a, in, a, in a general sense. I always thought that HUD was doing a lot more research I wondered sometimes how I could explain the research to the person who wasn't in a, in a house. Let me move forward again. Another editorial. Section 8, I'm sorry, another news item. Section 8 program administered by the U.S. Department of HUD is a low-risk enterprise with big rewards for developers who are granted a variety of financial incentives to attract private capital for individual projects. Is that a true, accurate portrayal of the program? I think so. I'm Next. trying hard to follow you, sir. It's, it's not... Well, I'm, I'm coming to a point. I understand. And I'm coming from a period of years, and I'm trying to take a hard look at the system involving both Democrats and Republicans, both administrations. The whole system is open to this kind of, of uh, misuse and abuse. Point. The cost. If not one more unit of Section 8 housing is ever built, the federal rent subsidy commitment over the next 40 years the average life of a building, for existing projects nationwide would be $231 billion, according to the GAO report. That sounds like an old number, but I would go along with it. Sounds it is an older number. Sounds like we're about six, forward. seven years old to me. It is an older number, but we're moving forward into modern times. The rents. Developers are charging excessive rents, sometimes more than double what a comparable bi privately built project would rent for. That covered the program? Uh, there are some problems with that one. There are some significant technical problems. It's, it's, there's some general truth to it, but you need to understand that there is a major issue right now which will probably be litigated in federal court, so we'll all find out what the answer is going to be. Could we but, change that? I'm sorry. Uh, but, but Congress created the FHA regulations and their applicability to rent, and Congress created the coinsurance regulations and their applicability to rent. And the two do not match. You cannot use them in tandem, and that's a major major, major problem. Because sometimes the department decides in, in one favor, and sometimes they go the other way. It, it's not even as if they say, well, in all cases where there's a conflict, we'll go this way. So, so you don't even know. I don't guess I'm looking for an in-depth explanation, although I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I find myself tending to agree with it. I'm just trying to make a series of points about the inadequacy of the program over a long period of time has now brought us to the point where we are today. Yes, sir. Here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, would you say, though, I could change that statement to say that rents are basically higher, if not double, at least higher, than private units. In some cases, that's true. Is it generally more true or not? I wouldn't want to mislead the Congress, sir. I would want Do to Do you know of any instance that. where government housing is cheaper than the privately built housing? No, but I do know of many where they're specifically about the same. All right. Inadequate monitoring of tenant selection. It's resulted in favoritism, racial discrimination, and outright fraud by admitting ineligible tenants. I would say that's true, and it's my understanding that HUD has made some efforts to clear that up. I, I understand the Inspector General has been in the past very active in pointing out problems in that area, and I think they're valid problems that they've pointed out. Failure to meet the needs of low-income and minority families. Most developments have been built for the elderly because that is less controversial and easier to win local approval for. That is true. For the record, Mr. Chairman, I'd like you to know that I'm reading from the Boston Herald American, for the most part, describing the programs existing in the state of Massachusetts and under prior administration. Now, I'm not selectively picking that out, but because reporters of Boston Herald American made such an excellent effort in a series of um, articles exposing the basic, not just Massachusetts, but the basic failure and weakness of the housing program, I want to bring a sense of historical perspective to the hearing. Now, I'd like to zero in on your role in this area. I think everybody involved so far, and um, I don't think we've ever met before, I don't know you, I, I think we're decent, honorable human beings are trying to do a job, but they saw an opening to make some good money, which is the old American dream. Unfortunately, it's public money, and we apparently have a system that's wide open to abuse by almost anyone with political contact. And since those of us sitting here deal with political connections every day, I think we well understand when someone says, yes, it was the person's political connection we were buying. 
And I understand that. At the current time, it is not illegal. It may be questionable. Uh, it certainly has turned off some people in this committee, including myself, but it is the system. Now, to the point. I was very intrigued with the chairman's uh, excellent handling of this hearing thus far, and particularly with his last closing question. Would you eliminate all discretionary usage of funds? It's about 15% now, I understand, HUD, and this is where most of the abuses apparently can occurred in the last several years. Would you eliminate any secretary's future use of discretionary funds? Is there a need for that provision? Yes, sir. There is a need for some small amount of discretionary funds in the secretary's office. I would do you venture firmly a guess? believe that. Excuse me? Would you venture a percentage? Well, it depends on the program, but I would say if we're talking about mod rehab, which is obviously the subject here, I think we're probably talking about uh, four, four or five percent. Not 15, as I understand is the current provision. I don't, I don't think so. My reasoning behind what, what, what I say to you is that would be the natural disaster, the major exigent uh, circumstances surrounding vacating a project of many hundreds of units, that kind of thing. And I think it would be important for the Secretary of Housing to be able to make a determination on strong, well-researched criteria and grounds that can be shown to members like yourself and, 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 and get applause instead of uh, booze as to why that, that's done. But yes, I do feel there's some need for discretion. But even then, uh, I assume that you would recommend some kind of screening committee before the, the uh, secretary could make the actual decision. Some kind of filtering process that if you had 17 applications, that they would recommend three, any one of which would meet all these criteria. And then you're talking about a, a laudatory program. That would fall in that category. The secretary's hands were tied to a certain degree, but he did have an element of choice. Something like that, sir, yes. I think that's generally correct. Let me go back to what you inherited when you came in. You're young, basically inexperienced, but obviously very talented. And I, I stand in respect in all of that. I think your testimony today has been uh, one of the most enlightening I've heard, and I think it's been very forthright. I'm interested in how extensive the disarray you think you inherited or saw. I wonder if you could dwell a bit on particularly the mortgage, uh, mortgages that, that you said were piled up or were located in an open vault, uh, security alone being lax and, and condemnable. Uh, what numbers were involved? Was that was there a simple uh, blockade of all action on those mortgages? What caused those mortgages to uh, to be able to just sit, sit there and languish apparently without attention? If, if I might, if I wasn't going to be plagiarizing, I'd like to borrow the chairman's frequently used term, but very very accurate. It boggles the mind with three G's instead of two. That's a phrase. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is. It, it applies. Chair. It applies as much, if not more, in this case than in any case I've heard the chairman use it. Uh, it is a. It is. The, it's the quintessential description of what I saw in the, that area, and of course I was not active in other areas of funding or program areas. But it was. It was truly mind-boggling. The secretary, to my knowledge, uh, was the largest holder, and I mean by name, not as Samuel Pierce, but whomever might be in the job of secretary. Because what happens is when a project goes belly up and gets into foreclosure, Fannie Mae or Ginnie Mae insurance claim is tripped, and uh, the, the HUD pays cash money to Ginnie Mae or Fannie Mae, and the paper, the mortgage, goes back to the secretary. Somebody takes it, and they stick it in the vault there, and it sits, and it, it becomes a home for bats and spiders. The, 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 the problem is that, that, that uh, it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew completely out of control. And the people at HUD, specifically the career people, there were no political people involved in this really, perhaps other than myself, were really dedicated people, or are, I guess they're, most of them are probably still there, very enforcement minded. So they'd take each case and want to apply the very best deal, almost as if they owned it, you know, as though they were trying to get the best deal for the government, for HUD. And that works, but it doesn't work when you have 10 or 15 or 20 people working on a million delinquent mortgages. I mean, it does boggle the mind. The disarray. Imagine this. There was no list that we were ever able to be made aware of of what HUD owned. How could they have even asked for a payment? I mean, talk about open for fraud or abuse. What incentive, other than his own heart, would an owner have to ever make a payment? 
payment one or payment three or payment four, when he knows that 50 owners around him have been going year in and year out without ever making a mortgage payment. Now, I hope that because of what I did at HUD and, and, uh, and what other people did after I left, that that has changed a little bit. And frankly, in the last couple of years, I haven't really looked at these figures. So, so bear with me when I say that they're not up to date or fresh or per, perhaps if, if Congressman Frank says that there were uh, hearings on this transfer physical assets issue, he might have a better or more accurate idea of recent, I don't know when those hearings occurred, uh, uh, to answer your question. Well, for the purpose uninitiated and layman, of which I am certainly counting myself one until the advent of these hearings, can you give me some kind of frame of reference, some kind of perspective as to what percentage of total HUD action was wrapped up in that vault represented by all those mortgages just sitting there? I mean, was that 10% of HUD action, 20% no, of HUD action? I think it might have. I don't know, sir. I really is. It's, I, I'm so unfamiliar with so many of the major funding programs at HUD in terms of a qualitative and quantitative analysis. I don't know. Then let me approach it step by step. The mortgages were mortgages on what units under what program, or were they mixed? Mixed would be all, all defaulted uh, HUD projects. Was Anything there, that tripped the insurance claim. Were they separately stacked? They weren't stacked when I saw them, sir. They were somewhere on the floor, somewhere on shelves. Some, I mean, they were there. Were these active mortgages on which payments were due to the United States government? Yes, absolutely. How many were involved, number-wise? I, 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 I'm. One thousand, ten thousand. Six a million? and a half years ago, sir. <clears throat> uh, oh, what, no, many more than ten thousand. I, I would. You're talking about think thirty or overall. forty thousand mortgages. It might have been more than that, sir. But, I mean, I, I know where to go to get the information. I just don't have it at my fingertips Mr. for Chairman, you. would it be possible to try and get a handle on that kind of information if the gentleman's wanting to uh, establish it for us? We, we, shall, we shall make every effort, uh, Congressman uh, Lucas. Uh, the other program you said besides mortgage maintenance, and uh, before we leave mortgage maintenance, perhaps I should ask you, what did you do in an attempt to organize that chaos? Start from the ground up, shake the whole system out, Would find out walking? what was being done so I knew what not to do in the future. Would you mind walking through that system? I mean, first you sorted them out? <clears throat> well, no, no. We, we, didn't start with the, uh, we didn't start with the mortgages first. <clears throat> first, we started with a process. How to identify value in these projects. You see, everything's constantly changing. Some of these when, once a landlord had no incentive to pay HUD, and frequently he wouldn't have any incentive to pay his local taxes. So local taxes would increase, and they would need a kind of a tax abatement. And they knew that in the prior years, and this is not a partisan comment at all, but in prior years... Be going beyond the previous Well, it would, be, I think it would be both, I think. But at a point, yeah, right, exactly. It would go back, and I think we're going back to 1970 or before. I, I believe I worked on 1967, 66 type projects. So this is old stuff. Impartiality has been established. Thank you. <clears throat> right. The the uh, the flow, uh, if that's an accurate description here, was and uh, it's not an accurate word, but the the procedure was non-existent. There was no method of identification. There was, if you don't know what you own and you don't know what's supposed to be paid, you certainly don't know what physical condition it's in. <clears throat> and the HUD area offices have a staff of, of career MAI appraisers, architects, uh, uh, engineers, people who can go to a project and do a punch list, but that takes time. So the, you, you can't take the whole staff, pull them out of all the other programs that they're giving that input into and just put them here. I think I recall seeing an inspector general report, which I agree with, that says that this is an underfunded, undermanned, undereducated, if you will, in terms of training uh, effort on HUD's part and that the only way to solve it would be to, to, to make that system better. But in any event, I was able to use the Office of the Secretary to, to put together a group of maybe 10 or 12 career people to move on this. And we established a process that I think was a fair and equitable one to everybody except an owner who had been not making his payments. And uh, then the career people went in and did their vault work, so to speak. Then they, they picked up the mortgages, they unloaded everything onto computers, which I believe is the case now. And I believe after I left that because of the enforcement-minded attitude of some very specific individuals I can think of in the Office of General Counsel, they were able to make a dent 
in that problem, and it may have been a very significant dent. Can you make me feel a little bit better at this time, as I've had a sinking heart during most of the hearings as to the Operation HUD over its history? Do you think the system you left in place uh, still survives or it's better than it was when you came, that they at least now can count the number of mortgages and that they're no longer piled up in a vault? I believe when I left the department that program was in, went from a 1 to a 100. And I don't say that in any self-serving way because the credit doesn't go to me. The credit goes to the career people who did the day-to-day -day hard work and the lawyers there who, who put together, I mean, they, it was their effort. I was at meetings, but you know, they would go back and they would do the grunt work and they would put this thing together and they'd use their brains. And there was just a lot of effort here. These were HUD employees who were regularly in the office at six o'clock at night. Uh, not the traditional kind of uh, thing that, that some people think about, some government employees, N not the case at all. They were very dedicated and they deserve the credit for that. Let me go to your question at this time, or your letter at this time then, for a specific question. The chairman very appropriately raised the issue of um, your rather generalized condemnation of HUD employees. And I read it a little bit differently, and I just want to give you a chance to further clarify, with all due respect to everyone involved. It says in the second paragraph, the one that we've discussed, in each of the above listed cases, Phoenix has had, quote, quote, these problems. Are you saying that in the other cases you handled in HUD, that the process seemed to work? You won some, you lost some, but the process worked. And in these four specific cases, there was a problem. <clears throat> well, these were early cases, but you're, the answer to your question is yes, sir. Some cases went uh, well, and, and I guess uh, so that could be the, in the eye of the beholder, of course. And some, some did not go so well. So you're rather skating, scathing criticism of the employees, <clears throat> officials, staff, and executive branch appointees applied generally but only to these people involved with these particular projects, not every project you dealt with in HUD. Yeah, this, as I said, uh, Congressman Lukens, I'm this is I'm trying to a, give you an out. No, no, I, I, I understand, and, and, I'm, and I'm, but I, I also don't want to uh, uh, take exception with the chairman to the point that I agree with him. Uh, there is, I, this letter, uh, that's a, that is a scathing statement, I guess you could say, and it, this letter was born out of frustration, and I take uh, the responsibility for writing the letter and signing my name to it, and I, and I felt that way at the time, and I, looking back, still feel that I was being, in those cases, unfairly treated. And on the merits, and I'd be happy to share, I mean, the first, it just so happens, the first one cited on there, our file on it, it's about 700 pages, it took 18 months to resolve, it's a project which was in 1976 abandoned by its owners in New Jersey. The owner ended up in an literally in an asylum. Uh, the, my, my client found him, obtained from his uh, guardian ad litem, I guess, a written acquiescence to purchase the project. We went into HUD. We said, you're spending something like 35 or $40 per day per unit in an unoccupied project that's been un un unoccupied for eight years, eight years armed guards patrolling around it. What exactly is your intention with this? Do you, you want to demolish it? Is it something that can be used? <clears throat> and it took us still 18 months to put that project together with the agency. To summarize, if I might, uh, this specific area of testimony without being inaccurate, uh, you have just commended, uh, I thought rather vigorously, the work of some HUD employees in helping to clean up the leftover mortgages in the vault so there, obviously, you have mixed feelings. But in this time, the letter is written. You felt very strongly that basically across the board, you were meeting this kind of uh, resistance and an inability to comprehend what they were trying to accomplish by just not answering phone calls and not being cooperative. Yeah, and I think morale had something to do with that, too, sir. I think that you know, from the top on down, you have to send a message. And, and a, a couple more questions in this area, if I might, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned that you had three major areas you addressed when you first went there. One is classified with FEMA coordination. Second was, the first one you mentioned was mortgage maintenance program that you went into, and you've described that in some detail. The third, as I understand, had to do with a consistent policy being established in what regard? Overall, the agency, administrative, oh, no, 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 no. internal I'm, procedure, what are we talking about? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, That's all. I just, you, you described it. I just did not understand it. it was all, that was as it applied to the Immigration and Refugee Act of 1981, sir, and its impact on the department. 
for instance, just a very simple, uh, simple issue, but, but a major one for the department, would, the simple question, would people who were uh, undocumented, not legally in the United States, be legally able to reside in public housing? They were so allowed until that point. Did that take a great deal of uh, time at, at that time? Uh, I, I recall putting significant time into it, yes, sir, because it required a lot of research into the... And we were writing for the President of the United States. I felt that that was something I really needed to put a lot of effort into. All right, in my wrap-up line of questioning, <clears throat> can you tell me, during the time you were there, where was the GAO with its inspections and where was the IG of the HUD with its inspections? Can you, I, I'm just fascinated by the apparent vacancy that there must have existed. Uh, I'd like to know if a live human being existed in either one of those categories where HUD was concerned. As it applies to the MRP program, <coughs> it's my is understanding the, what is MRP? to Section 8, Mod Rehab. If, uh, uh, my understanding is that this, that in 1980 approximately, the, I think it's probably the articles you've got there, were, uh, were, went coast to coast, New York to California, Wisconsin to New Mexico. And subsequent to that, the General Accounting Office, the, the investigative arm of this Congress, did a major report which essentially said the same thing that the Boston Herald, I guess it is, reporters had said. It backed it up. While I was not involved in this program at the agency, I never heard that from anyone until well after I left. In fact, I didn't see some of that article until recently. So where was the communication is my question also. Where was the... Uh, Where was the awareness of what was going on in this program when people were supposed to have been made specifically aware of it? And let me ask you specifically, and your comment um, led to this particular question. And you said you had some uh, coordination with, as I understand it, the IG at that time, that you were somewhat with the in-house IG. Yes, I was. Right. Some coordination. What did that consist of? I mean, obviously, that person, man or woman, in that title, uh, was responsible for internal monitoring. I was not, let me clarify my relationship with the Inspector General, it was very, very, very restricted and limited to some items dealing with the personal protection of the Secretary and continuity of government. It was not, I did not have any kind of IG oversight, nor would the Inspector General ever have reported to me any program criticisms, because I guess they knew I wasn't really program oriented or funding oriented. I would assume they would have gone to the uh, Assistant Secretary for Housing or directly to the Secretary. Well, I see what your question is, but I just didn't have that role of, of uh, I accept the liaison. I, I want to trigger off that a little bit. And in regard to the waste pile of mortgages that apparently set in the vault, once you found out about it, took steps to correct it, what role did the IG play in the correcting of that of that situation, if any. <clears throat> My recollection from the time I was there was that the IG was generally cooperative. In other words, if, if, if I had gone to the Inspector General with a problem, I think they would have taken it seriously. I think they would have looked at it. But you see, they knew at that point that, that there were problems and that we were trying to rectify them. And I guess they gave us whatever assistance they could. But it wasn't really the purview. My understanding of the Inspector General's actions are that they pr prefer to stay removed from the decision-making process so that later, if it's necessary to be criticized, they can do so from an independent standpoint. So it, it's my feeling that they would not have, for instance, had a person sitting in on those meetings, and they wouldn't have had anything to do with the sign-off on that process. And I know that sometimes they're asked to get involved. They were asked to get involved in the Section 8 process. I believe they were asked twice in writing to participate in the actual selection process. And they never did. They never would. Well, thank you, Mr. Strauss. And apparently, Mr. Chairman, a uh, great many people thought that they removed themselves from any active participation in the business of HUD. They could sit back at a later date and, from a detached point of view, and analyze and summarize. I, I find the testimony extremely disturbing. And it furthers and deepens my belief that the whole program has been, it is right now, currently, uh, Looked at, being looked at by Secretary Kemp needs a total revamp and that this problem extends over many, many years, not just the last eight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, am very proud of Massachusetts, but I, I, I don't want us to get undue credit 
the gentleman from Ohio said that he was quoting from the Boston Herald, but at least a couple of the quotes were from the Washington Times as well. So I do want to give the Washington Times uh, uh, do, do, I do delighted, credit. I'm delighted to accept the gentleman's correction. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the denunciation, uh, the 1973 study, which denounced HUD's Section 235 Rehabilitation Program, uh, uh, harsh criticism of the Nixon administration, that was, uh, that's in the Washington Times article. This is one of the, several in the Washington Times. The, um, Mr. Strauss, I should tell you that one of my other responsibilities is for what we call post-employment uh, lobbying restriction legislation, and I have some particular interest in the timing here. Um, Mr. Watt, let's begin with Mr. Watt. He left uh, the Secretaryship of the Interior October 9th, 1983, is the information I got. You approached him in February of 84, roughly? Uh, this letter is dated March. You said it was about a month later? Yeah, I believe it was about okay, that and time. I'm a little confused because you said when you were answering Mr. Lantos, I thought that you hadn't originally thought about using a broad project. No, I said I had not thought about using him exclusively for HUD projects oh, or, to, or, to, or to have a relationship with Samuel Pierce. He never said anything about that to me. Well, I felt that he could help us. I felt he didn't tell you that he knew his fellow cabinet secretary? Didn't you guess? In, yeah, I guessed. Okay. He, I did, mean, not I, I he did not tell me. I just want you to well, understand. We didn't have that Mr. kind Trout, of that's conversation. That's not worth mentioning. Okay. No one had to tell you that Secretary Watt knew Secretary Pierce. We've established that Mr. Reagan didn't know Secretary Pierce, but Secretary <laughs> Watt Secretary Watt paid closer, he paid closer attention in credit to him, and he knew Secretary Pierce. So obviously, Watt knew Pierce, and you knew Watt knew Pierce, and Watt knew you knew that Watt knew Pierce, so no one had to tell you that. Now, within uh, five months of Mr. Watt's leaving his job in the cabinet, you sent him this letter uh, confirming an arrangement in which he would be paid to lobby his former colleagues. Is that basically correct? including his HUD, and including presidential appointees. The reason I say this is, among the people, among the people whom you were critical of in this letter are executive branch appointees, i.e. presidential appointees. The reason I say that is, and I agree, at the time that was not illegal. It should be illegal. The bill that President Reagan, Reagan vetoed last year that I think just about every one of us voted for made it illegal, and we're going to pass a bill, I believe, this year to make it illegal. Mr. Watt, should not have been in a well-run system be for hire to lobby his co-presidential colleagues. And we will have banned that. Now, it was not, I stipulate, illegal at that time. It wasn't right, but it wasn't illegal. Um, that is one of the examples. What, well, you're, cor you're correct, Mr. What Thomas. grade level were you at when you were uh, a special assistant? Do you know where you were about it? I was a 15. I was, I was not subject to the prohibitions that right. you discussed. A 15 would not have been. You said you were there for two years, and after about a year, you began to think about leaving and, and uh, setting up this business, I believe you said? Uh, I said that in my second year, towards the... Well, you were only there for two. In my second year, yeah. as it began to progress, I began to think about the niche that would be in the private sector, because I, I kept hearing, continually kept hearing developer type... Uh, and the niche was because of how badly things were running, how hard it was to get uh, things through? No, I was really just... Well, I mean, in 1984, now when did you leave? I left in uh, May of 1983. All right. Now, your letter of March of 84 really instructs conversations you had uh, with Mr. Watt in February of 84. Yes, sir. So you left in May of 83. By February of 84, you're telling Mr. Watt that <clears throat> at least in these four regards, all the people involved are really doing a lousy job. Uh, including, and we can check with this, because one of the people who would seem to me to have been covered in this is Mr. Abrams, we'll get to him later, but Mr. Abrams was an executive branch appointee with direct responsibilities during this time. Um, and some well, of them were although, there. in fairness, sir, I don't think I was necessarily discussing well, Mr. Abrams in that regard. Well, appointees were you talking about? Who, for instance, the... Uh, well, Mr. Abrams had responsibility The levels for below, def the levels below assistant secretary, I think, were well, the Well, by appointee, do you mean presidential appointee? No, I meant Schedule C's. So that's what you meant by executive branch appointee? Yes. Because I thought when you said officials, employees, staff, or executive branch appointees. No, I think I don't think it was I don't think it was a term of art that I was using, Mr. Frank. So I believe mean, I was talking so about. So it wasn't schedules. true of any of the presidential appointees. No, right? I didn't say that. I'm just saying well, that in the letter, in the letter, in the letter, I meant. I don't think, Frank, that you, from my honest sense is you probably don't remember at this point what you rem remember what you meant in the letter five years ago and whether or not you did mean them or not. But I, if if they weren't or they should have. My point is this. This is a pretty terrible situation you described. Among other things, you said that they 
uh, legal claims of misfeasance or worse might be made. What do you mean worse? You, you're suggesting corruption in here? No, not corruption. Well, what's worse than misfeasance? <clears throat> Malfeasance, maybe. Nonfeasance, not, maybe. Well, I would think misfeasance would be worse than nonfeasance. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I, I guess... Would, as we get into the yeah. uh, feasance scale here, because, um, <laughs> you know, nonfeasance is not doing anything. Misfeasance is doing something uh, badly. I got my, my better lawyer over here, Mr. Marsden. Uh, malfeasance is generally corruption of some sort, it would seem to me. I, I, uh, I mean, what's worse than misfeasance? What I meant. You, were you suggesting criminal activity here? No, absolutely not. I was talking uh, you about... You worded this pretty loosely. You said legal claims might be made. Were any legal claims ever made for misfeasance or worse against uh, HUD officials? I believe there was a legal action by one of those clients after I had separated myself right. from them. I, I tell you, my, my inference is that Watt wanted this to cover up basically the fact that he was going to be used primarily to use his political influence because he didn't know anything about housing and, uh, and that may be why he... Uh, why he wanted it. Um, well, con case, con Congressman, can yes. I just state one But what fact? do you think you're going to get from what? I just want to state one fact in relation to what you just said. Jim Watt had no input in that letter. He told us he wanted a retention right. letter, and that well, was generated within our office. From well, you said it reflected your I thought I was going to get access. I thought access I was to get whom? To the, to the halls of power? No, no, no. The halls, you, you show your ID, they let you into the hall. Mm. I hate metaphors. They mislead people. You don't want access to a hall. You didn't want to use the facilities of the telephone. To people. To wh which people? We're not talking about some general. You're talking here about housing. You wrote him a letter about four housing projects. You said HUD stinks, and this one won't work, and that one's m misfeasing, and that one's worse than a misfeasor, and, and, and everybody that you mentioned wasn't doing any good. Only on these four projects, Mr. Lucan suggests the logical possibility that in every other way they were sterling. But in these four projects, they were abysmal. Which people did you think Mr. Watt was going to give? To which people did you think Mr. Watt would give you access? Non-specific people. Just non-specific people? People, people oh, who would like make the decisions, the decision makers at the agency. No, I, I don't believe you, Mr. Strauss. I don't think you were offering to pay Mr. Watt substantial money to give you access to non-specific people. Was it, uh, to, you, you really don't? I said decision makers, Mr. Frank. Which I meant ones? decision makers. At HUD. Anyone who had the ability to make a decision. At HUD, that, that and who would they be? You at were HUD, just left at HUD. HUD. You were just left HUD, who were they? They would be, I mean, it's a large list of people, sir. Would it be would primarily the presidential appointees, or uh, you thought Mr. Watt would have a particular uh, entree into the no, GS-14s? No, I felt of whom we primarily the, the Schedule Cs and, I guess you would call, presidential PAS appointees. Or, right. That's not a, that, I don't call them that. That's what, what the presidential Correct. appointees. Correct. So you hired Watt basically to, to give you influence with the political people. Um, in your own case, uh, did you approach any of these people yourself? Why did you need Watt? Or, I mean, why are you having been... Mr. Pierce's assistant, would you not have been able to do some of these things on your own? Uh, that was the impression that I had was I was no heavy political Had hitter. you tried beforehand? Uh, had you worked with some of these people? Had you tried and been rebuffed and then you... No, in some cases I have tried and been successful. In some cases I had tried and been rebuffed. And rebuffed. And uh, you were of the impression, however, having been there for two years... Uh, was, oh, no, I uh, when I say me, it wasn't always me, of course. It right, could have been... Yeah. Did you go to Mr. Pierce and say, Mr. Secretary, whom I served for two years, uh, you have some very serious problems on your hands. May I urge you to correct them? Did you go to any of the officials in HUD and say, I mean, you, you encountered some very bad situations. Did you go to HUD, people with whom you'd worked, and say, let's fix this up? Or did you say, I better hire Jim Watt and other people to, to, to take advantage of this or, or to deal with it? Did you make any effort to try and improve the situation that, uh, that you found out in your private sector capacity? I didn't. I never met with the secretary to convey. No, I didn't ask you. To, all right, one, you didn't meet with the secretary. Did, let me repeat the rest of the question. Did you make any effort? to persuade people at HUD to improve this terrible situation you talked about? I think I had conversations with a number of people that I knew from time to time saying that I thought this system was bad or that system Which, was bad. Which, at what level would they be? They would be to, at, at both career and... Well, you didn't, who were they? Do you remember any of them? No, I don't, but I know that my attitude was an angry one. And no, that, I mean, because been... I'm not into attitudes. I mean, I no, what my, you did my, about my, it. Uh, I'm telling you that I, my recollection is I had discussions, but I don't recall with whom. You don't recall with whom. So you made no. no, it does not sound like you made any concerted effort to try and improve this. I mean, you worked there for two years. Uh, you know, and, uh, we had questions before from the gentleman from Ohio, which <clears> basically suggested that, well, this is the way things always were. Uh, administration came to power. They said they were going to change it. They were going to improve things. They were going to impose efficiency a defense that uh, they were no different than they previously were wouldn't be very persuasive. And I think they did get worse, by the way. But let me say, I think the problem we have is this. There's always, and I, the, the defense that everybody does it, uh, and therefore implicitly it wasn't quite so bad here, 
I reject that, whether we're talking about people who beat other people or people who rob. The, 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 the notion that we're all guilty and therefore no one is guilty doesn't impress me in any sphere. I think it was probably worse here from what I've seen and read in part because what we often have is a tug of war. We have people who are trying to defend the program's integrity and people who are trying to use political influence. In this case, we had a one-sided tug of war because of the nature of the people who were in some positions at HUD, there were not enough people there defending the integrity of the program. So the people who wanted to pull in hall seemed to have more influence. And that seems to be what your letter is suggesting. Your letter says that with regard to at least these four projects, there was no legitimacy to the Department of Urban Development, Housing and Urban Development. This is in the, the last year of Ronald Reagan's first term, less than a year before that term expires. So most of the, more than three quarters of the Reagan first term has gone by. And what you say is that HUD has become, with regard to these four programs, worse than non-functional. And you didn't make any concerted effort to try and alert these people and to tell them about it? Not a concerted effort, no, sir. No. I'm going to just have a couple more minutes, and I can just, I guess, finish my question, if that's right, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and then uh, uh, move on. Um, just one other thing. Mr. Lukens raised a question about these mortgages that were uh, taken over and no one was making payments. In fact, that was probably not the problem because they were foreclosed. So we had, uh, I thought we were talking about mortgages that, that, that had been foreclosed. Both processed, so, processing, and foreclosed. And foreclosed. But the, 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 the majority, sir, were in, in the process, right. not foreclosed. Well, as to, you said that that system was improved, but we just heard from Marilyn Hurrell that she was able to steal very large amounts of money within the last couple of years uh, by not remitting, basically, what she owed HUD, having been their closing agent and having gotten uh, this money in these in these sales. Did not you that's not the same program, though. You understand? Well, so you weren't working on that this. Had kind nothing of to do with the property disposition that the case that you're referring to now. Well, she was dealing with. She HUD was property, different. She were, no, no, not not. I don't mean physically by name different properties. I mean a different program. I don't. I don't believe, and I only know what I read in the newspapers. But from what I've read, no, that was I not the that, same but, program. So you were you were not dealing with all HUD sales. You were dealing only with a minuscule. Two twenty one D three. The program where you say you were able to make improvement was minuscule. No, no, a minuscule well, amount of the overall programs at right. HUD. And so it was not all property disclosures no, that you were uh, that you were doing. The other thing I would just make. One of, don't want to misrepresent anybody. The hearings that this subcommittee had previously about the transfer of physical assets had to do with our efforts to prevent what we thought were derogation of the rights of the tenants, that we were opposed to sales of, the, uh, of right. those assets right. without a maintenance of the subsidy. So we did not go uh, uh, directly to that. I do have further questions, but we are going to be, uh, we have a vote on it. In the interest of that, I will, uh, I will defer. Thank you very much, Mr. Frank. Let me, uh, Mr. Morrison, are you going to? Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, I expect uh, uh, the, the chairman to be back here momentarily with some other members, so I know what we'll do at this point is to take a five-minute break, and he'll be back before then to continue. I'd like to say for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I have met, uh, as probably the staff has met with Mr. Strauss, uh, I have found him very cooperative and helpful in the questions that I asked uh, to him, and I have spoken to him on the phone on a few occasions and also found him very cooperative, and I appreciate the fact that you're here uh, voluntarily. Uh, I have a, a few questions that I would like to ask and, and very candidly tell you that, that you're really serving in some cases as reinforcement to what we've already heard about how the system works. Uh, Judy, uh, Judy Siegel uh, made it very clear in her statements, uh, in her statement she said in summary then, do I think the selection process was good public policy? No. Do I think a more competitive process would have been better public policy? Of course. But the system was there, I followed the rules and I developed high quality low income housing. Developers must not be blamed for the system they neither created nor administered. Uh, I gather that's your feeling as well. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, she also said, though, that Mr. Watt was the right man at the right time at the right place. I had a pretty good idea of what she meant by that. What do you think she meant by that? 
it, I'm speculating, sir, but I, <clears throat> I think well, that let me, what... Let me ask you this. Do you think he was the right man at the right time at the right place? I think others could have done what he did. Mm -hmm. Which was to do what? To access the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and get attention, mm -hmm. get a fair consideration from my perspective and attention given to requests that were before the agency. Don't you think, though, it goes a little beyond attention? In other words, don't you think it also meant that the department would look to act favorably on, on, on his request? At the time that I entered into the relationship with Watt, I felt that there was no guarantees, but my hope was that he would have a positive effect at the agency. Yes, it would be unrealistic to... Is this better? <clears throat> uh, it would be unrealistic to say anything else. I guess the point that I'm, that I'm a little unclear on as to how you feel, clearly he was presenting an opportunity for access, but wasn't he also enabling... Uh, you to probably have a better shot, not just at access, but at winning uh, a funding. A better shot than I would have had alone, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Even if you had access? Yes, sir. Okay, so your statement is that, he, that someone like Mr. Watt provided access and also provided a better shot at making your arguments? Yes, sir. Okay. Deborah Gordeen, and we've said this countless times, and it's interesting, she took the fifth in the committee, but was very willing to talk to uh, the papers. And we constantly referring to the papers. I, I can't wait to have her come before us. Um, she said it was set up and designed to be a political process. I would have to say we ran it in a, a political manner. Uh, that is consistent with what you feel about this program as well, at least as it was run out of um, HUD? Until the end of... Uh until the middle or so of 1987, yes, sir. James Watt said it was common knowledge on the street the going rate was a thousand to two thousand dollars per unit. Did you provide him that information? Uh, how did he know what to expect from his uh, working relationship with you and for uh, helping to secure the Kingsley project? I may have confirmed it, and then I did tell him that uh, what the gross receipts were on projects that we worked on, but they were not all $1,000 a unit. It's clear that, that he had no technical expertise, and we don't need to document that. I mean, he is so much as confessed to that. What did you have to do? Uh, what kind of work did you have to provide to, to bring him up to speed? What, what was the relationship that developed between the two of you? Well, the, na the nature of that would have been a little bit like cramming for an exam, sir. Okay. In what sense? In that we had to give him a high volume of information in a relatively short period of time, and he, what, without any uh, experience or knowledge about what we were telling him, had to absorb those facts and be able to regurgitate them if questioned. Mm -hmm. The bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, is that not only were consultant fees had to have been paid to certain individuals to bring access, and I watched your reaction. We were describing another, uh, I think, New Jersey program that was funded where the congressman came down and people from the mu community came down. And That's one of our projects, right. sir, yes. And uh, you didn't have to pay any consulting fee. And, and, uh, and that's really the way the system's supposed to work, isn't it? I mean, in other words, the community's supposed to want it. They're supposed to to present their case. Let me, let me back off and say not necessarily that's the way it's supposed to work because there still has to be a competitive process. Right, but that's the system I would like to compete in against anyone in the country, sir. Mm -hmm. I want you to take me through the process, and I, I need to limit your time on this because you could spend hours, but let me just tell you what I want to understand. I have a pretty good idea, but I want you to take me through the process of finding a site, of the application process, of the syndication and the development, and I'd like to, to, to have you just give me a very uh, uh, brief sketch of what the process is, the funding, the application, the syndication, the development. Are you clear on, on what my question is? I think so. I'm just okay, trying to think about this. how to put it in a manner that well, I let me, won't let me take put, all the put time. it this way. The government had five criteria 
in which a community could qualify. And my understanding is the developer uh, looks at that criteria and, and in an ideal situation makes a determination, <laughs> well, you have this criteria and this criteria and this criteria, what best, what area throughout you, in, out the country would best qualify? And then you would go to that area and say, now where's the best project to rehab? Is that correct? Uh, Run me through it. I think you know what I'm saying. You know, I, I do know what you're saying. <clears throat> that would sort of, that would depend on who, on, on the nature of the client. For instance, a client I'm going to interrupt you a second. Okay. I don't, run, give me the significance of the five criteria. Well, the significance of the, what we're talking about here, just so for the record we understand, is the National Housing Act, uh, National Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. That has a five-part test to be applied by extrapolation to the Mod Rehab program and was used in that manner in my understanding, during the quote-unquote fair share years. And then later, after the IG said significant changes were made, in essence, those seem to have been brought back into the fold as items to be used as basis for comparison. And they are, for, for instance, there, there's a special needs category, which would be natural disasters or exigent circumstances. There's general needs, which would be the waiting list, the length and type, and how recently that waiting list was uh, re-income certified. There would be previous underfunding to that locality in prior funding rounds, so that, for instance, if a, theoretically, if a municipality had not been funded before and other criteria were met, they would stand a higher chance in the rating and ranking if such process were done. Okay. Okay. Uh, the willingness of a developer to skew his project unit-wise towards elderly and handicapped individuals is also given weight under, that, uh, under those five criteria. So that if, for instance, you were able to reach one of the criteria in a particular public housing authority, that's good. If you could reach two, it's better. If you reached all five, it's the very best. In other words, it's, it's, it's a real, it's needy on every one of those separate levels. If, for instance, you have a volcano in the middle of a place that's already very needy, it's, it's twice as needy. I, and I think that makes sense. Uh, so. So that would be the, the, uh, the application, I guess, of those five criteria. The point is that if there were, if all five criteria were met, there would be a higher rating for that, that project, more likely to be funded. More likely to be funded. If you had a More justifiable vis-a-vis -vis anything else that's submitted to be funded. I mean, you have to look at the whole pie, the whole. The thing that interests me is that only a few people seem to know that some of the regulations uh, were operative and some weren't. How did you find out that they were no longer going to follow certain regulations when they no longer going to allocate based on geographic determination? <coughs> Congressman, to, to be honest with you, I'm a little bit confused having watched some of the prior testimony as to the nature of, of what you're talking about. It happened after I left and I wasn't privy to it, so, and I don't completely understand all the testimony that I heard, to be honest with you. I don't know how to reconcile that with, what I know is that it was a general, uh, it was not only general knowledge in the field, and when I say the field, I mean the universe at large, but the HUD area and regional offices acted in support of that, uh, that being true. That is, area offices, for instance, wouldn't accept, to my knowledge, an application for mod rehab funding, when well, it would have been nice to have been able to get them involved very early on, because they have the local HUD knowledge, but on a local level. See, they wouldn't accept the application. Yeah, but you're a little confused, and so am I right now, be uh, because you know this system better than anybody. Honestly, of all the people I've ever spoken to, you know this system better than anyone. And if my recollection serves me well, uh, I think you even told me that uh, you even sought through freedom of information to get memos between uh, uh, units within HUD to know what the heck HUD was doing. Yeah, well, well, let me give you a specific example of that, Congressman. I read somewhere in the, uh, in I think the IG's report, that, that uh, I don't remember whose statement it was in, that projects of up to 200 units would be considered. There's no regulation that says more or less than 100 units. There's no written policy I'm aware of that says more or less than 200 units. So if you were a developer and you had come to me with a 201 unit project, how would you know you stood no chance against a man who had a 199 unit project? 
that was part of the problems within HUD. No consistent application. I don't know whether the word arbitrary would be appropriate there or not, but Congress didn't say anything about 200 units. And if they had, then I would have gone in with projects uh, tailored to meet that. I would have been careful to, to do that. See, we had Mr. Watt who really gave the career employees a big hit and said, you know, I wanted to go to the political people and get them to do their job. Your letter kind of implies the career employees weren't being responsible, and you clearly hired Mr. Watts. So that I see both were not being responsible, sir. Right. Both career and Well, they, they became political. responsive as, after Mr. Watt got involved, it w regrettably, but they did. In yeah. some cases, yes. Yeah. In some cases, though, they specifically did not, with Watts' involvement, did not become, not only didn't they become any more helpful, but in, those, in, in several particular cases, which I can enumerate and document for the committee, Watts' in input was zero. Yes, it will. I just think that we're in danger of getting confused here between the, the Watt involvement in the MOD rehab program, uh, which what he was what he testified in bulk about, in which he said there was paralysis, and which all our testimony suggests that uh, it was not in the hands of the career employees at all, and these transfer of physical assets cases, where there was a regular a career employee review process, it would seem to me. And I think if we don't clarify that, we're likely to be confused about what Mr. Watt did or didn't say. And um, I think that perhaps uh, my colleague and friend from Connecticut wants to keep those separate in these questions. Yeah, but I, I haven't even introduced anything but mod rehab. That's all I'm well, talking but th about. This letter is, is mostly about uh, TPAs and not about, uh, one of them's a mod rehab and the other three are TPAs. Is I that believe right? so. Okay, but let me ask you, you I'm, I'm focusing specifically on your use of Mr. Watt for a mod rehab. Okay. Okay. With Judy Siegel. Okay. That was the connection. Okay. He said, she said he was the right man at the right time at the right place. Uh, and he was instrumental in giving you access. But clearly he was more than that. He was instrumental in helping win this project, which you feel is very worthy. When I first started out this hearing, I thought the big sin was clearly that consultants were making money uh, that they shouldn't have to make and that you would have to go out and hire a consultant. And admittedly, it's been described that the consultants were paid out of the so-called profit side, which I gather was the side of, of, of the syndication and, and the ability to get the tax write-offs and so on. I mean, that's basically the side you were able to pay them from. Syndication proceeds. Yeah. The proceeds from the syndication. I'm sorry, syndication proceeds, yeah. yes. But my, uh, my question to you is, and let me, let me, I guess I have to be very, very upfront with you. My problem in this whole thing is that one, you have to hire the consultants, but two, you have people like yourself who are part of the system who are now using the system because they're the only ones who understood how it worked. You're describing your role as being someone, I knew how it worked, but I didn't have the, the contacts. And you didn't even feel it was right to use the one key contact you had, which was, which was Mr. Pierce. I mean, you, you seem to accept that there was uh, some moral ground not to involve that relationship directly. Yes, which I violated one, one time, I violated my own credo there, and I did write one letter to the secretary on a UDAG, which was denied. Mm -hmm. I just felt so angry about what, in that case, I felt the department was doing, where they had induced a developer to separate his application in halves, funded the first half, knowing that the second half was dependent upon that, and then never funded the second half. And I just felt that was like a kind of an inducement to rely, and it was just, I was just really angry about it. And uh, I, I wrote that letter to the secretary, but I didn't win anyway. And I, I appreciate um, my colleague from Connecticut making sure that, that, that we're all clear on what I'm asking. I'm asking Mod Rehab. But you hired Mr. Watt. Mr. Watt gave you the contact. You paid him a consultant's fee. But one of the things that came through in our Tuesday uh, hearings with um, uh, the consultant and, and operation in New Jersey and other program in New Jersey was that consultants also represented another cost. And the other cost they represented is sometimes they were able to get unworthy projects funded. Now I see where you're headed, sir. 
Now the un unworthy projects end up costing us more because the developer is able to get uh, basically his operation cost plus uh, his carrying costs for a period of 15 years. Uh, and they're allowed to charge whatever is the fair rent, fair market rent. The tenants pay what they're able to pay up to 30% of income. And the difference is made up by the federal government. Now, obviously, if the rent is higher and the income level of the tenants is a certain amount, that gap is filled in by the federal government, correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. And obviously, if the federal government certifies you can charge the market rate, which is pretty high in a certain area, then the federal government is having to put more into that project. Indirectly, yes. How come indirectly? Well, because you'd have to compare that with the same funding going on elsewhere. I see where you're headed, Congressman, and it is, it is potentially, but perhaps not always, more costly from a strict economic analysis. However, there are many other problems that create other economic, downstream economic negative ramifications like a cascade effect when you pump a subsidy into some place that either doesn't need it or doesn't want it. I, I, two things are probably synonymous to a large well, extent. You're making a, another point as well. You're saying a community doesn't want a project that ends up with a project because this program was basically developer driven for the most part. Uh, yeah, I would say that it was mostly well, I, I developer don't, you driven. Don't, you yes. don't have to be no. reluctant in saying that. I mean, there's no it, doubt. I, I think that it is, uh, in that sense, developer driven. Right. Yes. And the developers who had the contacts ended up, as you said, getting their programs funded. And the cost is not just the consultant's fee, to the, which ultimately the developer says he paid. It's, it, the, the real cost to government ends up being unworthy projects that were funded that cost the federal government more money than they should have. It's my understanding, you were here when this program was operating, now, my understanding, the mod rehab, we, we, had, we, used to, we had three parts to Section 8. We would build totally from the ground, buy the land, build totally up. New then, sub and mod. Yeah, and then you had total renovation, and then you had the mod, and the mod's the only thing by the end of the Reagan administration that was left over. That's correct, sir. Now, that program that was left over, there were, according to the IG, which he accepted with no no verification whatsoever that there were certain regulations that no longer were operative. And, and you're saying this is the part where you become a little confused. Confused, uh, sir, in that in our business, myself and my partners operated under the uh, assumption and, and, uh, and, and documented our projects or processed our projects strictly from the 221D4 uh, five reg area. Now, my, uh, uh, you basically looked at the five criteria and said, you know, the, the more, if we can get all five, we've got a more worthy project. And that's on the basis of how you make your argument, that's correct? Part, that's one of the criteria, okay. yes, sir. And the other criteria? Uh, my comparative basis base of, of uh, analysis of overall projects based on two things. Pro people who come to me with projects that I get to look at and know will not make it through for one of a variety of reasons, and two, the amount of recapture that would occur within this program at the end of any given year. Because if HUD funds, does a funding, and then at the end of the year hasn't, the, uh, or at the end of the, uh, it's actually a two-year period, that funding hasn't been used in the manner it's intended, then it goes back to the general treasury. So, so that if Congress decides that, for argument's sake, 5,000 units is what the nation can get in light of the limited funds that Congress has to give out and the many places they have to give them, in the many needy places they have to go, Congress determines that it's 5,000 uh, units that's appropriate. You have a shift. You lose that, given the scenario that I think that you're. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to tell you I didn't understand a lot of what you said. Well, <laughs> rephrase the question. Let me re-answer it for you. Let me ask you this. As a developer. the question, you didn't understand the answer. I'm not sure if I asked it again, if I'd understand it either. The, um, the Mod Rehab program, there are two costs to government and potentially two benefits to the developer. One cost is, is the cost of the 15-year rent subsidy. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, that rent subsidy is, uh, is based on your operating and debt service. 
and it will only go up to a certain amount based on what the government feels is that legitimate rent subsidy. Is it fair to say that, that the government's determination of what a fair rent subsidy is a significant decision? Because, yeah. pardon me? Yes, it is a very significant because decision. Because it's, it's the basis for how much income you have for the next 15 years, correct? And whether the project will be economically okay. viable at all, yes, sir. Now, who makes that determination at HUD? The, uh, my understanding is that the Office of Policy, Development, and Research, which is a division within HUD, has its own uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, combines census data and other data to come up with, uh, and market rate data, to come up with a list of what fair markets rent, rents are across the United States, and those are different in, in every city, sir. It becomes very subjective, correct? I think it becomes subjective. I think yeah. that th 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 the easier system is to use a, mo a uh, comparable system. Mm -hmm. uh, the other f way that one makes money, and I think the way that probably, uh, and I'd love to know uh, the significance of this in terms of your perspective as a developer, is that still retained under the Tax Reform Act of 86 were mm -hmm. certain allocation of credits to a developer. Um, and that those would be syndicated, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. How mm. did you make your money there? I mean, in other words, let me, was this where you made your money, or did you feel you made your money from the, the rehab of the, of the buildings and the rent subsidy? No, sir. The builder <coughs> would make a, a cap. There's a, there's a limit on what a builder is allowed to make. So if the builder owns the building company, he's got a cap. And uh, the developer would make their money one of two ways, essentially. If they held the project through its life or towards the end of its mortgage amortization period, then the project would be resold or refinanced, staying under the HUD regs as a low-income project, and the developer might take cash out at that point. Or the more likely and numerous scenarios would be uh, syndicating the project. And, syn and uh, I think that you're aware, essentially, of that process, but it, it involves the sale of the tax credits, uh, and, and uh, each syndicator pays a different ba a number of basis points on each project. But I think you could look at well, if I were to break out your, your income, of which you said basically 80% of it was HUD-related, um, taking the HUD-related portion, did you tend to make more money from the syndication part, more money from the consulting part, or, um, and I needed to ask this sooner, did, did, do you still have, you have ownership in certain of these buildings, correct? I did not, uh, I have ownership in, uh, actually I really don't. I, I have a limited partnership interest in one project as a limited partner, as a specific okay. term of so art. So basically it's, it's the consulting fees? Consulting fees which were, which were uh, linked to what we perceived the developer would make on syndication. In other words, when a developer approached us, we would assume that he was syndicating, he or she was syndicating that particular project. We knew what the rough syndication amount would be. We, one of the things that Phoenix did was to generate a, a computer model, sir, which would enable us to put in the economic factors of each project into the model and basically spit out very close to what the actual syndication would be given certain assumptions. Because if there's a change in one of the criteria that you've used in the computer model, it, of course, will change your bottom line. But essentially, we could do that with any project in the country. The, um the relationship that you had with people at HUD clearly didn't end when you left. Uh, you obviously chose not to go to the secretary, but you had other relationships. You knew that HUD was an agency in disarray when you were there. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Is part of the reason you left because you simply didn't want to be part of this agency, or was, did you decide to leave because you simply realized there was a way to, to make money on the outside and make a lot more, uh, and you chose to do that? Why was, what was, I know the chairman asked you your reason. I just felt that when I had a conversation with you, I learned something a little differently. Uh, I want you to describe the morale of the agency when you, you were there and why you decided to leave. I think that in many ways the morale of the agency was very poor at the time I left, but that was not the primary reason for my leaving, sir. The two things were not related. I can answer your question, but in my mind, so the two are not. So answer it again. Uh, just uh, I, I believe that the morale was, was in many ways generally very low. I think there were conflicting policies between the administration and the Congress, which caused 
people who were really in the housing business because they were concerned about it. I'm talking about the HUD employees now, and they, were, they felt that that was a significant portion of their life, if not their whole working lives. There were different signals being sent to them, and that created low morale. But, but, the, but, the, but speaking for myself, I think I, I, the real reason that I left the agency was to, uh, to earn a higher income. The thing that amazes me is I'm 43 years old, uh, soon to be 44. I would be proud now to have the job you had at age 24, 25, and 26. And the income you made then was not uh, insignificant. Not at all, sir. Yeah, you didn't feel like, gosh, I had a great future in government. I'd like to be here for a long time and make a difference. Of course, now I'm talking to you with the benefit of 2020 hindsight behind these microphones, sir. I, I uh, am no longer enamored of this town and the general way things move here, and it's just not for me anymore. Okay. So that's it. Let me just touch on two other areas. I mean, two, one other area, and that re regards your and and I honestly have forgotten what you told me, so I wouldn't be able to come back at you with it. But you are under oath. I want to know specifically. Uh, the relationship you would have had with um, Deborah Gordine in a professional way and um, uh, your relationship with Tom Demery. Both have been obvious players in this. I met Deborah Gordine when I was at HUD. I had been there for about a year. She came in, I believe, and I may be incorrect about this, as the executive secretariat to the secretary, which is essentially the chief correspondence control officer operating out of the secretary staff. We were friendly in the way uh, co-workers would be friendly, uh, but it was not a, a deep friendship at all. At the time I left the agency, she uh, remained there, and I believe in that same position of executive secretary for approximately a year or more after I left. So, and during that period of time, <clears throat> that acquaintance or friendship relationship basically dwindled, and, and in the last, I think, three or so or more years, I may have seen her for 40 minutes one time, uh, possibly at a party uh, in addition to that. So after that first uh, year of my leaving and yet prior to her taking the position of executive assistant to the secretary, which I don't know when she took, but I think was about a year or so after I left, there was, there was a limited social uh, relationship. But, but basically, I think that's about it. I may have called over there to get information. I may have called over there to talk about a specific project, but not from the funding perspective, because that she wasn't in that. Now, uh, Jane, before I get to Tom Demery, James Watt said that it was just a happenstance, not his exact words, that he ended up meeting with Deborah Gordine before he saw the secretary and after. In other words, he thought it was reasonable she was his chief of staff, so to speak. That is absolutely uh, very difficult for me to accept very honestly. Well, I'm, I must tell you, sir, that in my briefings of him, f uh, with him, before he went over there, I would have given him a picture of, you know, who was at the agency and what they did. Right. And that would that, include Deborah Dean what, as the executive assistant to the secretary. Well, this, but the point is, and that's the reason why I asked the question before, what kind of, of, of training did you give James Watt? And you made it very clear, you, he crammed for an exam. Uh, he wanted to know everything he needed to know. He didn't want to make a fool of himself when he had his, exactly. his window of opportunity. Now, you know that Deborah Gordine was a very key player in this process. You also have testified that m Mr. Uh, um, that the secretary was, uh, in so many words, uh, somewhat laid back. Uh, maybe you didn't. Uh, I think hands-off was the word hands I Hands-off, okay. Um, and there was just a, a funny remark that Barney Frank made about uh, that Ronald Reagan didn't seem to know the secretary and so on. And we get a general feeling that we had a secretary who wasn't much in charge. Now, you were priming James Watt. Uh, now, my question to you is... Let's put the timing in perspective, though, Congressman. I'm aware of two meetings between Watt and the secretary. The first meeting uh, wherein he met with the secretary, I believe, dealt with Puerto Rico. And at that time, I don't believe Dean was in that position of executive okay. assistant. I believe she was still the correspondence control officer. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to check the dates, but I think you'll find that I'm correct. And then by the second time Watt went over there, which is now mid-1986 or early 1986 on the Essex, Maryland project, she is in the position of executive assistant to the secretary. But he, Watt, 
has made a unilateral determination, and I believe he stated this here under oath, that he was, I'm trying to recall the words he used, but to the best of my recollection, it was something like, I decided that I was just going to go to the top, that this problem was only one that could be resolved there. Well, I have to ask you something because you are... I did not send him to see anyone specifically. He did make a unilateral determination to visit with the secretary. Am I to understand from your testimony that at no time did you describe to Mr. Watt that Deborah Gordine was a major, major player in this process? By the second time he went over there, I may very well have described that, but he nonetheless... Now, this is very important. I, 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 I'm I, I, trying the, hard to go back three and a half years and remember okay. a particular conversation wherein I briefed him on a myriad of facts and circumstances, okay. and I would expect that I did tell him at the second time he went in that Deborah Dean was, in my opinion, a significant part of the decision-making process. That was generally what to I knew. To the best of your recollection, you, you did that. It was reasonable that you would have. Yes, I, 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 so I agree, on. yes. Okay. Uh, Tom Demery, your relationship with Tom? <clears throat> uh, Tom Demery I met briefly at several meetings while I worked at HUD. I, I don't know the name of the position that he held, but it was some kind of a consulting position within the agency. Uh, I left HUD. He later came into town, and I'm trying to remember, I think it might have been uh, late 86. Uh, I had occasion in late 86, or early 87 to see him uh, a number of times we had, uh, I, I got to meet his wife and his family and we became friendly later on as, as time went on and he was living in Washington. He had moved here from Michigan, which was you know, sort of uh, why there was no relationship before then. Did you ever give, ever give contributions to, was it Food for Africa? I did make a contribution to Food for Africa. How much was that for? $15,000. I have to tell you something. $15,000 is a lot of money. Yes, it is. And why would you have given that, of all programs, $15,000? Well, first of all, I have given other major charitable contributions in my life, number one. Number two, uh, I was invited to a dinner, to attend a dinner in New York City by a friend of mine who I, I like and respect. Who is that? Lance Wilson. Mm -hmm. And I attended that dinner. And uh, he told me that it was a charitable function, but did not elaborate. And uh, I got to the dinner, and I saw a presentation, a video, a slide presentation, and heard uh, the, the founder and, I guess, executive director of the charity, Peter Pretorius, make a speech. And I was very much moved, Congressman. I, I understand that it's very easy to be cynical about some of these things, but I had seen starving children on television like we all have. I had seen all of these pleas. But I always had a personal attitude that, that uh, you know, sometimes you write a check, you don't know where it's going, you don't know yeah, the institution. You know, I, I, I but no, but I want to explain something, because sure. it was really important to me. I saw this whole thing, and I saw that in this particular uh, charity, it was a single geographic location, that is a village, being built called Life Centers for people. And as someone who was active in building, I was aware, uh, made aware that night by Peter Pretorius that for $6,000, these people could put together an a house that would house 10 people and keep them, them fed for a period of time. And that just before this dinner, according to Pretorius, and, uh, and he explained it very clearly to us, because of the situation with the rebels in Mozambique, which is where this charity operates, a truck, a semi-tractor trailer had been stolen and they had food a major amount of food rotting on the docks that needed to be moved immediately. And I was moved by that. And I gave, I gave my, a check that night to Peter Pretorius. To my knowledge, Demery had no awareness of it. He never asked me to contribute or told me to contribute or, or anything like that. And that was the reason I, I that I accept the it. fact that, that you were motivated once you were there, and you, and you certainly had the income to provide the 15000 But I guess my problem is that you went there in the first place. and, and and I, I'm saying that you're under oath because uh, I don't think you've done anything dishonest that could, could, could send you to jail. But I would not want to put you in a position of, of perjuring yourself or anything like that. Uh, Lance Wilson, didn't he work for HUD? At one not at that time. At one time he did, yes. Yes. What, what was his position? Executive assistant to the secretary. So he had Deborah Gorstein position before Deborah Gordine. 
I, he and did he, have it he, before her. I don't know yes. if there was anyone intervening right, in that right. intervening time. With Samuel Pierce, under Samuel Pierce. Yes, so. yes, sir. Why, why, would, why would he have said you should go to that? Why did so many developers give to this program, which also happened to have been Tom Demery's program? I mean, I, I uh, thought Lance Wilson has invited I, me to a number of, this. of things. Did anyone ever suggest that it would be beneficial to you uh, to, to give to this program? If you're going to give to somewhere, it might as well have it be this program uh, since a major player, Tom Demery, was a part of it. Absolutely not. And Wilson didn't ask me to give either. He just invited me to a dinner. And I did not buy a table or anything like that. I understood that that's how the dinner worked, that people bought tables or bought chairs or something like that. I didn't do that. I just went, I sat down, and I watched the presentation. Yes. Yeah. You testified a bit earlier that your annual income was about $160,000. Uh, average, yes, sir. Average. During that period. Yes. So this $15,000 check that you wrote out literally amounted to a tithing donation. It was about 10% of your income. Uh, I believe that was a Phoenix check, sir, but yes. Uh, it would have, if you want to use that as a basis of comparison. Were you making correct. Were you making charitable contributions during this period in this range? In the five thousand dollar range. No, this was fifteen thousand. Right. No, no, not in this range. Was this the largest single charitable donation you ever made? Yes, it is, sir. Thank you. I consider you such an intelligent man, the most intelligent of all the people I've spoken to in this whole process. Thank you, sir that it defies my logic that you wouldn't have had any sense whatsoever that there was a relationship between people making decisions uh, and um, the fact that it made sense for you to go up to this meeting. And we have the documentation. If anything, I felt the IG overproved their case and spent too much time on this side of it. But the, the clear fact is that a significant amount of Food for Africa, a very worthy program, I want to say, from what I can tell, extraordinarily worthy program, got a lot of money from people like yourself doing business with government. I mean... I, I take great exception to certain factual items in the Inspector General's report, which I didn't know until I had an opportunity to review that report. And, and I think this committee has made it clear that there are at least some significant questions open as to the whole nature of that report. So I don't want to, I don't want to comment on, on that aspect of it. I am telling you, being fully aware of being under oath, that I was asked by a friend of mine to go. I went because I wanted to. I was not aware of the nature of it before I got there, but I certainly became aware of the nature of it that evening. And I made a contribution because I really thought it was the right thing to do. And to my knowledge, at least until this investigation came up, I am not aware that Demery had any awareness whatsoever of any contribution, whether I had made one or how much it was. I certainly didn't give it to him, and he didn't solicit it from me. Okay. And so it, it's your testimony that in no way uh, did um, uh, Lance Wilson encourage you to come to this fundraiser and suggest in any way that it would be appropriate since this was a fundraise, this was a foundation uh, that Tom Demery had uh, and that it, it would be a good thing since you do dealings with HUD to give to this? To the best of my recollection, I don't believe Wilson associated it with Demery. I made the association when I got there myself. Could you describe to me your relationship with Mr. Wilson? Uh, Mr. Wilson was and is a, a, a good friend of mine. I see much less of him in the last years because he lives and works in uh, New York City, and I uh, live and work in West Virginia. But he, I still consider him a friend. Does he ha have any business relationship with you? I've never had any business relation with him of any sort, in or out of HUD. Let me just uh, close and, and thank the patients of the committee by just making this point to you. I, I wanted you to walk me through the process. I didn't think it would be that hard to just give me a brief rundown of the funding site, the application, the syndication, and the development process. Is that possible that you could give me like a six-page description sometime in the future on that? Is that oh. something you'd be willing to do? Just yeah, I would, I would be willing to meet with put you. It and, in, put it, and, well, and yes. I'd like it in some kind of writing. Yeah, I, I would be willing to, and, to do and that. And let, let me just say to you that, that in my talks with you, in my talk with you, 
the feeling I got was that this was an agency in extraordinary disarray, that the morale was very bad, that uh, in some ways uh, you didn't feel it had the prestige of working in, in some of the other cabinet uh, departments, uh, that the Reagan people viewed this as, as, as not the best place to be sent. And you decided that, that you wanted to leave. That you also gave me the feeling, and is that, am I correct so, so far? I think all of those okay. are factors in the decision. And, and yeah. that, that it was in such disarray that things were happening between units that the general public didn't know about, least of all the public housing authorities. And that you uh, felt that one way you could find out besides talking to people was to actually through freedom of information, get a hold of memorandums and, and, and paper that went from one department to another. Not only FOIAs, but every means possible, yes, sir. Congressional Affairs, Public Liaison, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing, General Deputy, uh, on down, anyone we could call to get any information. And this would include additional copies of handbooks for clients, I mean, even the most simple things, as well as all of that internal policy memorandum. But it's true you would go to the Freedom of Information just to get a document that Deborah Gordine might have written to someone else or some other person? Uh, not anything that Deborah Gordine would have written. Okay. I'm talking now about policy technical matters, not political matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to pick up on that very last point, because I, I missed it, this took place, that is, your search for materials while you were within the agency or after you no, left? No, no, I'm talking about after the after agency, you left sir, the agency. yes. Okay. Um, In the agency, it would have been no problem. I mean, I would have just gone immediately to wherever I needed, and as an officer of the secretary, they would have sent me or given me the material I fine. needed. Fine, thank you. Um, I missed the very <clears throat> early part of your testimony, and so some of my questions may be repetitive, and I apologize for that uh, in advance, but my understanding is that you served uh, in the agency for about two years, is that right? From, from, and from when to when? May of 1981, sir, to May of 1983. Okay. Two years. And when, while you were there, uh, you were with the, what, we had nothing to do with mod, mod rehab at all, no, is that not, correct? No, no funding decisions, committees, what or What program were you involved with? Uh, well, they're not program, they're not programs, what sir, office? but. I did federal emergency management work. I did transfers of physical assets work. I did immigration and refugee policy work. Essentially, those were the three main areas of my okay. activities, along with letter writing and that. And in response to a number of questions, you had said that, well, that change uh, took place after you had left and you were not familiar with it. And I assume that that, that referred to uh, regulations or adherence or non-adherence to regulations, uh, both in the transfer of physical assets as well as the moderate rehab program. Is that correct? I believe I believe so, sir. If I understood your question. Well, I, I'm trying to get an idea as to what you what you testified to. There were a number of questions that were put to you about some changes in procedures or regulations, and you and uh, that was in the transfer of physical assets process. Yes, sir. Okay, and you had. Had you any familiarity with the moderate rehab program while you were within the agency? Just generally. In other words, there's a, there was a book written by HUD describing its programs, fairly sophisticated description, which, we had, which there was an expectation that all of the special assistants would read and understand. But you had nothing to do with the program no, I had no as such? Okay. Now, you then left the agency in May of 1983. Uh, and set up for business for yourself? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell me, if you will, how you went about setting up in business for yourself. Well, what I, what I did, sir, was I uh, located the, a team of professionals, primarily attorneys, but other people, technicians like Judith Siegel, who, you've, uh, who was testified well, before okay, the committee. Well, okay, before you go further, how did you go about locating this team of professionals? Some of them were uh, individuals that I had met. No, uh, some of them were. In, yeah, I, I guess some of them were individuals I had met at the agency uh, in the in, in attorneys slots, career people. Uh, Judith Siegel I had met at, uh, at the time I was leaving the agency. She was an air. She was in a uh, company that did equal opportunity investigations uh, for the government, uh, uh, and I 
grew to respect her and we had conversation shortly after I left and I recruited these other people and I brought them into a, a company. And how many people? What, what size was the company that you set up? Well, <clears throat> initially I, I hired uh, uh, three attorneys, uh, Judith Siegel, one or two UDAG specialists, and then as time went on, sir, more, uh, that was the initial, sort of the initial group, I think. Then all of the secretarial support that they needed, uh, we had to establish uh, our library, our reference materials, applications. And when, when did you open your doors? Uh, very shortly after I left uh, the agency, a week. With Immediately you? upon leaving. Okay, and you say you hired attorneys. Um, you hired them on a salary basis? You yes, sir. In-house, full-time, salary basis. And? Except for uh, uh, Judith Siegel, who was the same net impact, but I paid her on a retainer basis quarterly, and, and it wouldn't be legally appropriate to classify her as an, em an employee because that would not be correct. All right. And where did you open your offices? I think that our initial address was 1575 I Street here in town. Okay. And... What was, what was your overhead in the first month of operation? I, I don't have any well, idea, sir. Was, what, were you, what were you, at what rate did you hire the attorneys that, uh, that, that you hired? Hmm? Yeah, uh, uh, not everyone came out immediately. In other words, this was not a group that was formed in a matter of just days. It took some time to put this together. but. But uh, the attorneys, I would say, would be in the uh, forty to sixty thousand dollar per annum range. And where did they come from? Uh, the HUD. HUD. They were primarily. They were previously, excuse me, employed at HUD. At various levels, or in, very, in various programs of, of HUD. Uh, the two attorneys I'm talking about that I hired first were UDAG in the UDAG area of HUD. Right, and then the third. The third was in the housing area. Moderate rehab? I uh, don't know what her prior experience, right. if any, I don't think was in moderate rehab. And what kind of rental were you paying? I don't remember, sir. Not, not real expensive. Well, I guess the question I'm asking is, where, where did the resources for setting up this operation come from? When we established the business, we uh, were doing primarily, in the beginning, this transfer of physical assets process, which I don't think you were here for, but right. uh, is a process whereby uh, an individual will come up, come forth, and uh, be interested in purchasing one of a number of HUD projects were, which were either foreclosed or in the foreclosure yeah, know, process. How, how did that those individuals would pay me retainers, the, the, well, and those, were the re those retainers were used to pay these salaries. Okay. Did you have those retainers before you left the agency? Oh, no, of course not, sir. Now, I'm asking you, how did you go about getting those? How did you set up business? I'm not sure I understand. I, I, I well, knew people that were in the business. They knew me. They knew I had uh, been at HUD and left HUD. They came to me, uh, and they said, we want to do transfers of physical assets. We are aware nationally that there's a big inventory out there. We want to do this, and here's our retainer check. Did you send out notices, announcements, cards to anybody at all announcing that you were in business at a certain location? Possibly after I left HUD, not while I was there. Oh, after you left HUD. I, I may have. I don't remember. In other words, some of these people I had known generally, even though they had not had any HUD experience or, or particular uh, experience in the TPA process, and those individuals would come forward did come forward and say, we know that you've just left HUD, and we are eager to understand that the tax law. Were. No, they knew where I was. They knew I was in Washington. They knew I had been at HUD, and they knew that I had, uh, had just left and was still in town. I wasn't hard to find. Well, Mr. Strauss, did you have a, a general listing with, uh, with, with the telephone company, with, uh, with an office? I mean, how would, how would the general public, or the, that part of the public which is interested in transferring your physical <coughs> assets, uh, locate you out of all the people who are in Washington? The initial ones knew me as an individual and as, as what I did you at the agency. I assume that you discussed with some of those people while you were at HUD that in fact you were going to be going into the private sector. Isn't that correct? I probably mentioned to people I was leaving the agency. Yes, sir. Yes. 
and, and, and solicited business. Not while I was at the agency, sir. No, I, I would only have told people I was leaving the agency, not that I was soliciting their business. Okay. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, after you had these three attorneys and Ms. Siegel, uh, you reached out to some other people, and at one point you said you decided that you needed heavy hitters, and you then reached out for Mr. Watt. By the time you wrote this letter of March 12th of 1984, uh, you refer to having had a number of enjoyable meetings with him, conversations with him. Uh, when did your conversations begin with Mr. Watt? I, as I testified earlier, I believe it was in the month of February. And how did that conversation or meeting take place? As I testified earlier, sir, the uh, introduction was made by the executive director of a group called Citizens for America, a grassroots lobbying organization, and Watt uh, had maintained office space, I believe, in the Heritage Building with that group, and, and the friend of mine introduced us, and we started chatting. We talked about what he wanted to do, and, and, uh, and I told him some of what I was doing and what I had hoped to do in the broader scale business-wise, and at some point subsequent to that, we came to an agreement that we would be associates, but that he would be able to do his own business and, and, and his own things that had nothing to do with us, and we would be doing our own things that had nothing to do with him, but we would have an association of sorts. Now, Ms. Ms. Siegel had a, was associated with a number of companies. Were you associated with all the companies that she was associated with? Were you partners or? No, no, sir. Uh, she was a, a uh, she was a, an entity retained by Phoenix Associates, my company, and that's it. That was the only relationship that I had with her was through my company. Had she left the agency before you did or after you did? She was never at the agency. But you she got was a private equal opportunity specialist, uh -huh. not a public official. Okay. She was never a public official to my knowledge. All right. And you had an arrangement with Mr. Watt, which detailed in this March 12, 1984 letter, four specific projects on which he was supposed to get paid certain set amounts. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, did you have a similar agreement with him? on the Essex project? Uh, verbal agreement, sir. We did, I did not have a written agreement with him on the Essex project, no. And? I can go through that again if you'd like, that whole process. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Uh, as I explained to the committee earlier, it's important to go back in time. Uh, when I initially opened Phoenix, we established a network of finders of real estate. And we put together a matrix of projects that were appropriate for one program or another nationally. And we did this on, on a private side. And one of the projects which we discovered, which was very viable under the Mod Rehab program as a potential, was the Essex Maryland okay, project. By, long by before I met what? By discovered, what do you mean? I what? mean discovered. I mean a Somebody finder. brought to your attention? Is yes, that the idea? Uh, yes. yes. A fee oh. finder brought to our or brought right. to okay. my partner's attention this project. Uh, we went to visit it. We went with uh, architects and engineers. A punch list was drawn, an analysis of the earlier okay, application. Okay, now, you had... You and this had is all before Watt has ever met, uh, before I've ever met Jim Watt. Okay. In other words, I meet Watt that February, shall we right. say. This is, this is uh, approximately six months prior to that. Right. So th this thing has been found. Now, there were problems in that the owner wanted more money than it was worth, and it was difficult to negotiate, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm trying to make a long story short, right. but to be accurate with you, sir. The, uh, the project was in and out of our office on an active basis through that entire period. Watt joins forces with us in 1984. 1985 goes by. We have more visits, if you will, with the right. project and its activities. And it comes to 1986, early 1986, I believe, is the, is the date. That's when... My partner uh, decides that she is going to try and develop that project, offers me the ability to be a co-developer with her, but I did not have the risk capital and want to put the risk capital out necessary for that. I told her I would work with her on all of the other aspects of the project, its syndication and the technical level. Right. Uh, I was aware because of what we uh, charged as fees and the fact that obviously she was my partner, we were in business together. I knew what she was, if she took the development role herself, willing to pay which was $300,000 on that project. Uh, she and I was out of the office at that point. She and Watt were together. So they reached an agreement between the two of them without me 
that they would enter into a contract and that Watt would assist her in helping to influence the selection of that housing authority, that housing authority submission being this project. Uh, I worked with Jim Watt to brief him, and this is a somewhat minimal timing thing. I think what I've said was about two weeks, and not, right, not even right, full right, days, right. <clears throat> uh, because he had a habit of wanting to know everything about the project right, instead okay. of being able to stand questions. And uh, they agreed, uh, she agreed to pay him that fee of 300000 She was aware, not of the specifics of my uh, agreement with him, what, but that generally I would be sharing, in fact, in that fee to All right, some now extent. Let, let, let's turn to how that fee was arrived at. Uh, had you had a discussion with Mr. Watt before he entered into the agreement with Ms. Siegel as to what the fee or to be fee arrangement would be? Not as to the fee arrangement by number, sir, but I knew that what that number would be because of my experience in the field and what we had charged other clients. And I did have a discussion with him that I w wanted to share in that fee on a 50-50 basis with him. And that's before Ms. Siegel agreed to the $300,000 figure? I believe so, sir. Okay. And there, there was apparently a sliding scale. $300,000 was the minimum. It could have gone up higher than that, depending on what the, the total benefit wa was to the it was an It was an either or. It was a greater than the greater of two 000. sums. Right. So Minimum of 300000 yes, sir. Right. So that you had, you had coached uh, or briefed or advised Mr. Watt as to what he ought to be asking Ms. Siegel for. N no, 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 no. I had coached and briefed Mr. Watt on what he would need to tell the Secretary of uh, Yes, HUD I know that, but, uh, but you also had... I didn't have to coach him or brief him, sir, only because he knew at that point what we were getting on other projects that didn't even have anything to do with him, that it was $1,000 a unit. Uh, he had a general expectation. I presume that that was the amount that a developer would be willing to pay. In other words, since, since when we acted as consultants, that's what developers paid us, then if we took the role of developer and needed a consultant, that's what we were willing to pay. In the course of his testimony, uh, we referred, we asked him about the fact that for the Corinthian Apartments project, he, his uh, fee was $20,000. And we asked him why it was that only $20,000 when he got $300,000 for uh, the Essex project. And he said, well, you, you, he and his partners laughed about that afterwards because apparently uh, he didn't know enough at that point to ask for a sufficient amount. Did you feel that, in fact, you had underpaid him in the Corinthian apartments development? No, I don't feel I underpaid him at all because Corinthian Towers, A, was not a mod rehab project. B, we were left with approximately a 700-page internal file on that project. That's our work product, and I thought I paid him and on the high side. And how about on the, uh, on the Puerto Rico project, where he apparently received uh, $100,000? $100, and there was a sense, I guess, on, on his part on that one also, that he might not have been, he might have asked more had he known more at the time that that, that project w agreement was entered into. He, he might have asked more. I would not have paid him anymore. But, but you believe that the $300,000 minimum on uh, Essex was, in fact, justified. Because why? This was the fee that the, developing, the development community active in this arena was willing to pay, sir. That was the, that was the going rate. That was, uh, that, was, that, was the, that was the rate, sir, I, I'm, if I'm understanding your question correctly, or I hope I'm answering it fully. Having nothing to do with the amount of work? Not on an hourly basis, absolutely not, no, sir. Having to do, any, having to do, basis. having to do, the, the number came, in my opinion, yeah. from the expectation of develop, what developers' profits would be, assuming a syndication on any one of these projects. And of course, if a syndication hadn't happened, there, there wouldn't be that, that large dollar availability to the developer. In other words, if the developer kept that project for their own account, it would be much harder for them to pay a fee of that size. And you said that Ms. Siegel would have known that there was a participation uh, in Mr. Watt's fee by you, but she would not have known 
the extent of it or how much it was. Is that I don't, correct? Uh, yes, I don't recall specifically ever now, discussing was that. Now, was that uh, because it was none of her business? It was because you had asked Mr. Watt to keep it quiet? What was, why, why wouldn't she have known since she was a partner of both of yours, right? Well, she had signed the contract with Watt and uh, it was, wasn't a secret. It just, didn't, it just didn't really come up. I knew and she knew what she was paying. I, I sort of assumed that she knew I was getting a significant amount of that, maybe half, maybe more, maybe less. I, I just, we just never, we never had that discussion. She signed that contract with Watt on her own and, and came to those conclusions on her own. I was not even personally or physically present at those discussions or signings. Had I been, then we all would have known what was going on. I just happened not to be there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Morrison. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Strauss, I want to go back uh, to some of the nitty-gritty um, about the Mod Section 8 project. I just want to note at the start, you've been making reference to, um, to statutory criteria. Um, and I'm a little confused. There are no statutory cr criteria in Section 8 itself um, as to uh, Mod Rehab. And the only criteria I'm aware of applying directly to Section 8 are regulatory criteria, some of which had to do with fair share, and some of which had to do with the characteristics of individual housing authorities who were applicants. Um, there is in the statute which um, gave rise to the fair share provision, Section 213, subsection D, there are within that references to what I heard you talking about, handicapped and minority, participation set. Is those the criteria that you were referring to? Well, I understand, it's my understanding, sir, that the 221D4 uh, was by extrapolation applied during the uh, um, fair share allocation period. Whether, I, that stat, whether that was applied statutorily or not. Are you talking about 213? Or are you no, I think I'm talking about 221D4, sir. I, I, I do make mistakes, but I, I believe that those five criteria enumerated are, are there. These are criteria in, in the Section 221 program, which has nothing to do with Section 8, correct? Uh, not directly, but it was, it was during the fair share years, sir, my understanding that the application of, of those rules was made to this program. Okay. And, and sir, sir, I just would, would, if I could bring this up, if I'm incorrect, then the new regulations, which, which were uh, uh, the significant changes that the Inspector General talks about that occurred in late 1987, did you... There were no regulations in 1987. Well, the, the criteria, if you will, that came up at some point, 88, 89, whenever yeah. it was, do use those five criteria. Those criteria, as I understand them, are the criteria that are in the regulations that were always in effect except that uh, Mr. Knapp, who was here a little earlier, didn't quite sure whether he said they were in effect or not, or who he said it to, or when he said it to. Um, but that's, uh, so that I'm still confused, and I don't think you're clear on, and I would ask that you submit for the committee in writing what standards it is you're referring to, because I can't find the standards you're referring to in any legal structure that relates to the program. Sure, sir. Um, now, when you, uh, when did you first get involved in a mod section 8 project what was the f when when did you first when was your first mod section 8 project uh, i believe in uh late 1983 sir late 1983 <coughs> and um what project was that i was involved in a project in puerto rico sir which was funded but never came to fruition it was funded and that was during the time that the fair share provisions were in effect I'm not sure, sir, because I'm not sure exactly how that. I'm, I'm, I am equally confused as to the nature of the suspension of regulations and when and what. So you don't know what what the basis of that was. W w tell me about how you pursued that particular project, that first one. <clears throat> we. Uh, w tell me what your role was. First of all, you were a, you were the developer. You were a consultant. What was we your were role? a consultant to the developer. Uh -huh. Who was the developer? Uh, D, uh, Mr. Diaz in Puerto Rico. And what was the name of the project? I believe the name of the project was uh, Old San Juan Rental Group or Old San Juan Rental Company, something like that. And how did you, um, so go ahead now, tell me what you, how you uh, act, what, what role you played in that, and what you did. I flew to Puerto Rico with uh, at least one other member of uh, Phoenix Associates. We visited the developer, we, visit, we visited the project, 
We visited the Public uh, Housing Authority. We determined that the Public Housing Authority was, in fact, uh, not only greatly in need of housing in general, but was specifically targeting uh, the, the old San Juan area, which is why that name came about, uh, within, the, within the municipality of San Juan. And uh, I determined, and I was operating either mistakenly or correctly, under the belief that these five criteria were very relevant to HUD's decision-making process. Uh, I knew that Puerto Rico met the special needs, the general needs the criteria of what I'm going to, for the purposes of this conversation, continue to call 221-D4 requirements. I knew that 62 percent of the Commonwealth uh, is below the United States national poverty level and on food stamps. I knew that uh, because of all of that, there was a real ability to, uh, to look at the Commonwealth as very needy by any objective standards. And uh, uh, th those were, that was my uh, basis for approach to the agency. Approach to what agency? Well, approach to HUD when we finally put together a project. So in other words, you approached HUD uh, with this proposal? Yes, sir. Well, the regulations that have always been in effect for Mod Section 8 are quite clear that developments and developers are not eligible for funding, that full funding from HUD goes to housing authorities and other eligible housing uh, public entities that uh, act in the role of housing authorities. While I was Do you understand that to yes, be true? Sir, yes, sir. And while so I was interested in this project, I was, I was, my approach to HUD and the standards had to do not with the project, because the standards don't have anything to do with projects, they have to do with PHAs. This was the island-wide PHA, as opposed to, say, the city of San Juan, so that they had total jurisdiction of distribution of this anywhere on the island. And uh, uh, that was, my approach was on a PHA basis. I'm aware of the well, non-project specific rules. You were working for, you were not working for this PHA. No, sir. No. You're working for a particular developer. That's correct. What assurance sir. did you have that this developer would ever get funded? No, no assurance whatsoever, which is why the developer never laid out any money other than a small amount of option money on what I believe were units that were either available from the city or, or uh, deteriorated to such a point that their value was minimal. And we had no idea whether or not we would, in fact, have this funding assigned to us. And, in fact, we have not had, had all of that funding assigned to us. Well, now, you've, spo you've spoken subsequently about a number of other projects you were involved with. with. You talked about the, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about the Essex project that you were involved in with Mr. Watt and Ms. Siegel, and you were, talked about Gastonia. And you've talked continually about particular projects and taking up these projects with people at HUD. When did it, did it uh, become clear to you, or did it ever become clear to you that, that HUD was, in fact, targeting particular projects as opposed to particular housing authorities? It never became clear to me that HUD was targeting uh, particular housing projects, but as uh, my partner has testified, there was a public notice out from HUD that allowed open pipeline, pipeline, and non-pipeline projects to be funded, that is, non-pipeline being those to be no-foot afterwards, so that in the event that a, a, either an open pipeline or pipeline procedure was being used, in essence, HUD was saying they wouldn't fund a, proj a project specifically, in other words, with knowledge of it, but yet it seemed to be the rules or the, or the system that an application could legally be made by a housing authority where that housing authority had in its mind to use it for a specific project. And that was something that was always unclear to me and an obvious, an obvious question mark as to how you, you, you reconcile those two things. Because you, you did have a public notice that did make it acceptable and legitimate, apparently, at least in my understanding, to have a public housing authority, for instance, submit a request for a 51-unit uh, ex-bedroom type mix. Yet HUD was saying, and I don't know if this is written, sir, but I knew that it was the HUD policy, to not fund on a project-specific basis so that it seemed to me that it would be acceptable or normal to, for a public housing authority to ask for that 51 X mix request, and yet if they did it by name, if they said it was for the XYZ project, that HUD would in fact reject that. Well, uh, how do you explain what, what, whatever it was that uh, Mr. Watt was hired to do with respect to Essex if it was not to push a particular public project? housing authority? Public housing authority. Well, he wasn't authority. paid by the housing authority. He no, he was paid by us to. And that was, a, that, was a, that was one of the reasons that I didn't pay him on a salary basis, because what could very easily have happened is he could have gone in, uh, lobbied, 
successfully for a particular public housing authority, we might not have gotten the units and I would have been out of pocket X dollars. So I wanted to always wait to see if the public housing authority would assign those units to us. And in, in several cases, and I've told the chairman that these are, this is not my imagination, this is, this is real, there were a number of cases which can be, uh, can be documented wherein that ex exactly that happened. That is, we were successful in, if you will, extolling the virtues of a housing authority's needs, and then when that housing authority got funded, we didn't see Unit 1 because they made an independent determination. Someone else's proposal was So there. now, when you, um, when you briefed Secretary Watt, you briefed him about the housing authority. Absolutely, and sir. And not a word about the project. I may have told him that we were particular. In fact, I would assume I did tell him that we were interested in a specific project, and he might well have even known who the developer was. But I told him that he HUD... Have, he knew who Ms. Siegel was. Did no, no, no. I'm, the developer? I'm talking about the earlier project. It, well, let's, clearly, talk, let's just stick to Essex for the minute. Maybe okay. I confused you. Okay. Because I remember Mr. Watt's testimony being quite specific that what he was briefed on were all the details of the project, not the housing authority. That's correct, sir. One about the, the housing authority. There, there are two instances, sir, of his meeting with Secretary Pierce. Now we're on to the Maryland situation, yeah. which is different. So I'll explain the Maryland situation. The Maryland situation was a pipeline project. So clearly, he not only knew who the developer was, Siegel, because he had a contract with her, and obviously he knew that. He also knew that the nature of the state of Maryland's interest was in that specific project. However, I did brief him that at a meeting at HUD, HUD will not allow a decision to be made on a project-specific basis, even though they are apparently legally able to fund the public housing authority which has made a request for a specific number of units. And, and you see the, the, the problem of reconciling that, but you've also seen the public notice, sir, and, and that seems to be the, the way the system was, and it was terrible. It just didn't make sense, but that is, that is the writing. Those are the writings. And you explained all this to Mr. Watt. You told him it didn't make sense, and uh, he was going to go in, and he was going to ask for funding for a housing authority, but you had it... On the basis of massive state support, the governor, the public housing authority, the prior application, the waiting list of, I think it was 4,000 people, uh, which, which of course was, uh, what, 15 times the amount of the project. Uh, yes, I, I did explain it to him, and I did explain to him that it is not appropriate in a discussion with HUD to bring up the name of a particular project because they, from the HUD angle, didn't seem to want to hear that. They wanted to hear why a particular public housing authority. So his briefings were oriented to why a particular public housing authority. Sir, I, I just, I, I understand, I think, how you feel. And I understand the distress of this committee. But I also want you to understand that this is not a system that I had anything to do with creating. And I wasn't trying to end run it, in fact. What I was doing was locating what I felt were good projects first, obviously. I was not advocating. Uh, just for some public housing authority just to advocate for them. Obviously, I was advocating for a specific project, but I knew that within the rules, you were to take that public housing authority, you could advocate for it, but you couldn't advocate for the XYZ project. And, and that, those were the, the rules, and that system was no So good. It, it would be fair to say that, that, that you, you were aware that the system was not working in accordance with the rules, that there was this double talk system in which uh, HUD was formally speaking, supposed to fund housing authorities, but everybody was running around hiring consultants and lobbying HUD to fund projects. Yes, sir, that's essentially correct. Well, uh, you might be interested to know Secretary Pierce sat in the very seat that you're sitting in and, and read from a, from a written statement in which he said he set up an appeal process for projects and developers, and he didn't understand why that was a strange thing for the Secretary of Dunn for a program that couldn't fund projects or developers. I didn't hear, I, I, I had seen Secretary Pierce's testimony on tapes, or I didn't hear that part of it, and I'm unaware, totally unaware of any appeal process that you're referring to. If that's in writing, I, I would, that would be Oh, very story. little is in writing. I don't know what's in writing, but the, his testimony said that. They said that was why he set up the committee. I, that, now, this would be the first time I'm hearing that, sir. Yeah, now, you worked as special assistant to uh, Secretary Pierce. Yes, um, Did he take a direct interest in how programs were administered? As I uh, testified, I don't think you were here, sir, that uh, 
I worked in three very specific, very carefully delineated areas when I was at HUD. And in those areas, I found him to be aware of, of what I was doing. And uh, I reported to him on a regular basis. And outside of those areas, I had very, very little information. But very in little. the areas where you worked, he was regu you regularly briefed him? Yes, sir. And he did seem to be aware of, of the actions that you were taking and he, took an interest in them? He, he seemed to be to me, sir, very interested. And how about the staff meetings? You attended regular staff meetings, is that correct? Yes, I did attend the secretary's staff meetings. And did he ask questions at those staff meetings? Did he seem to be aware of what different uh, members of his staff were doing? Yeah, the format of those meetings, sir, would primarily be uh, the secretary and then the various division heads of the department at the table and then their assistants on the outside. He would go around division head to division head. First he would raise his points of issue and then he would take any, I guess, new business, you call it. How that. often did those meetings take place? I believe the meetings were about once a week while I, in the two years that I was there, sir, but he was not at all of those meetings. But he was on travel. usually there? He was there frequently. How uh, often was he there? I think the he was there frequently, but but I do know that he traveled quite a bit, and he was also away some of the time. So we shouldn't necessarily conclude, despite the public demeanor that that the secretary has has presented to us, we should necessarily conclude that he was unaware of the details of of various projects that were being carried on by his assistants. That I don't know, sir. I mean, I. I well, I mean, uh, you're saying projects were never discussed at these meetings, if that's what you're Excuse asking. Excuse me. Projects. No, no. I mean, I don't this mean this projects. Is more, this is more departmental type. I don't mean business. development projects. I mean projects like things that people were working on on his behalf. In other words, you were her his special assistant. If they were working on it on his behalf, I would think he would be aware of it, sir. Yes. Well, uh, so when you were working on things on on as his special assistant, you reported regularly. He went into the details, and you would say well, you were confident that he knew what you were doing. Yes, sir. So we would be justified in asking whether he knew what Deborah Dean was doing when she was giving out mod section 8 contracts. Of course you'd be justified now. So maybe we're being misled by the secretary's I don't know anything about anything testimony. I, I, I can't. Uh... I can't, that, that, that's just totally outside of my But But it's not consistent comment. with your experience. In other words, if he were, if we'd asked no, him No, it is not consistent with the areas in which I work. Yeah. I'm only trying to, to let you know, sir, that the areas were not funding areas. They weren't program-oriented areas in the traditional sense of the word. So, you know, it's a little bit of apples and oranges. Because it's not very apples and oranges because, frankly, in, in hearing the Secretary's testimony before the Housing Subcommittee and this subcommittee, I've never heard him acknowledge knowledge about anything that he was asked about in any detail, and you're giving us a very different picture of a person who in fact paid attention to what his special assistants were doing. In, in all of his dealings with me, sir, he paid, he paid careful attention and I think was aware of everything I was doing. So maybe this public demeanor isn't what, uh, uh, what it seems to be. Now, one, one other area I'd like to question, and that is with respect to Deborah Dean. Um, what is your understanding of her role in the MOD Section 8 program when she was the executive assistant to the secretary? My understanding is, uh, is that she was a significant part of the decision-making process within that office. How significant? I've heard the term uh, ultimate decision-maker be used here and other things like that. That I don't know. But yes involved, yes significantly involved, uh, to what extent or by what method and you knew that at the time. Whatever. In other words, you knew that you, at the time you were, do, you were working in this area, you knew that No, Deborah no, Dean sir. Uh, when I was at HUD, Deborah Dean was the... No, no, no. When you were oh, yes, working yes. as a consultant, yes. if Phoenix was doing this, this kind of work, you knew that one of the key players was Deborah Dean. Yes, sir. I mean, that was the, that's not a, a new not. revelation that has come only because you've watched C-SPAN and seen these hearings, right? No, sir. No, that is not new. That was, I think, widely known around town. So equally, given what you've said about Secretary Pierce and what you just said about Deborah Dean, wouldn't you be surprised to hear that Secretary Pierce didn't know that Deborah Dean was a key player? Yeah, I would be surprised to know that, that to, to hear that he felt that she wasn't in the decision-making process. Well, he maybe felt she was in the decision-making process, that she was a key player. He testified to us that this was all being done by the Assistant Secretary for Housing and that Deborah Dean was kind of a paper uh, sorter in this process. 
again, sir, I, you know, I, I want to be helpful to you. I really yeah. do. But, but to tell you something that you wasn't under, there. That's not the way you understood it when you were working on this. I understood on the streets of this city, sir, and, and you and I are both on the same streets and it's the same city. I, I understood, and I'm not being facetious at all. I'm, I'm trying to treat your question very seriously. That was not a joke. I understood that she was a significant part of the decision-making process. And when you hired consultants to go to HUD and get the job done, whether it was UDAG or Mod Section 8 or TPA or whatever else, she was one of the people you expected them to, to influence, wasn't she? No, sir. First of all, uh, I was operating on a very technical basis. At the point at which I was going to make an appeal to the agency, regardless of how their decision was made, my approach was identical. It was based and it had a foundation, and I'd be happy to now, later, or whatever, in depth, specifically go over with you the nature of that, that technical criteria. I never had the feeling that she was a technician, and I never had the feeling that she was necessarily technically aware of even the kinds of things you and I are talking about. Well, but when you hired, when, when Mr. Watt was hired, to in, he was not hired to influence the, the career employees. He was hired to influence the political appointees, right? He was, he was uh, hired to influence any of the employees that we would have yeah. had but to you, do but business with. You knew, I'm not begging the question, sir. I'm really not. You I'm, didn't really I, think he was going to go talk to the GS-14s and, and, and well, the like? Well, he actually did do that on a number of projects which I can enumerate for you. So whether I expect it or not, he went to meetings with just career-type people and sat there. And part of the reason was, uh, I think, that May, uh, here you have a cabinet secretary sitting in the room, maybe people will pay more attention, and this is on the technical level, not the political level, to what you're trying to talk about, as opposed to maybe not meeting with you at all or not giving it that same level of consideration. Okay, but you did testify earlier that one of the people you probably told him about was, I'm sh was, was I'm Deborah Dean I feel and her sure, without, being, without having a specific recollection, I feel certain that I would have said to him, uh, this is what the... Uh, uh, this, you know, obviously, what Sam Pierce's role is. Deborah Dean is his executive assistant. She is involved in the decision-making process. Uh, the feder the uh, Federal Housing Commissioner is involved in the decision-making process, and I would have gone through a sort of a description of those people that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Strauss. I think you have uh, answered all of our questions, and, uh, and we want to thank you for your cooperation. Thank the you, next sir. witness is Mr. Philip Abrams, former Undersecretary, Department of Housing and Urban Development, if you'll please uh, come up to the witness table. Would you please raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. Abrams, you are appearing on a voluntary basis. Subcommittee appreciates this. We would like to begin by giving you an opportunity to read any prepared statement uh, or submit any prepared statement. If you don't have any, you may proceed in your own way. I don't have a prepared statement, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm, uh, due to the lateness uh, of the hour, willing to respond to your questions. If you'll pull the mic very close sure. to you. <clears throat> Please describe for us your total involvement with HUD. Uh, I went to work for HUD uh, in March of 1981 uh, as uh, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing, Deputy Federal Housing Commissioner. Uh, then I became Assistant Secretary for Housing, Federal Housing Commissioner in the fall of 82, and I became Undersecretary in the fall of 83 and left uh, after the election in 1984. How did you obtain your initial position at HUD? Uh, well, I had been approached by a trade association, a contractor's trade association that I had been the pre national president of, uh, who were asked to submit resumes to the transition team. And they asked if I were uh, interested in uh, public service, I thought about it for a couple of days. I had read some things uh, that uh, 
encourage people in the private sector and a business to that they had a duty to when called upon to to go in the uh, government and I had uh, uh, told them that I was willing to have them submit my uh, resume to the transition team. Uh, sometime later, I was interviewed by the transition team. Uh, I then was interviewed by Secretary Pierce, uh, and he recommended that I talk to uh, uh, Mr. Wynn, Ambassador Wynn, who was uh, his selection for uh, Assistant Secretary for Housing, uh, to discuss uh, joining the administration. Can you describe for us your responsibilities with HUD? Uh, well, the f when I first came to HUD, it was uh, as a uh, construction development expert, more or less. I, my, my background is in the construction industry. I started in 1952 or so, was uh, working as a construction worker for a family firm during uh, vacations and uh, at other times, and then full-time after I got out of college, uh, again after I got out of the Navy. And then I went into business uh, as a contractor and became a developer contractor uh, from 1966 to 1981. When I went to HUD, uh, Ambassador Wynn's uh, needs at the time were for someone with that kind of expertise, uh, technical construction development expertise. And I started uh, in that capacity. I got involved with uh, a number of policy issues uh, uh, and uh, did a lot of learning uh, about... How, uh, how closely did you work with Secretary Pierce? Uh, well, I, I worked uh, closely with them, uh, more so as I gained more responsibility within the... Well, department. when you were under secretary, for instance, did you see him on a daily basis? No. Weekly basis? Uh, we had uh, weekly staff meetings, and uh, we, Secretary Pierce would uh, chair maybe half of them, and I would be there, and uh, other than that, it would be on an ad hoc basis uh, when I was... Uh, when I had something uh, that I had to discuss with him or he wanted to discuss something with me. Now, you are familiar with Secretary Kemp's description of HUD as a swamp. Are you not? I've read that. Do you agree with that description? I can only speak from my own experience. Uh, in, the years I w in the years I was there, uh, I didn't regard it as a swamp. I regard it as a an important agency that was uh, carrying out important missions. Uh, we, we, there were a lot of, there were a lot of problems. Uh, I thought we made tremendous progress uh, uh, towards improving uh, the administration of the programs. Uh, we, uh, we uh, had some very able people in very key positions uh, and made progress that uh, ranged from uh, taking, uh, well, the areas I know best are FHA. Uh, you're dealing with the largest uh, mortgage insurance company in the world, I think. Uh, and at the time uh, we came in in 1981, they were working with pencil entry bookkeeping. Uh, they just hadn't, the, the staff hadn't been given the kinds of modern business techniques and equipment. Uh, those systems were computerized. Uh, the underwriting systems for FHA were computerized. Uh, we uh, uh, worked very diligently, I thought, to uh, improve all of the management systems uh, and to do things in a more business-like way. Uh, well, did all the deterioration came in the last four years? I mean, have you been following these hearings? Have you been following Secretary Kemp's statements? Uh, I, I've followed some of it, and uh, I'm... Uh, I, I don't know what happened in the last four years, and I feel very badly because it, uh, uh, it, is, a, it is an excellent agency and uh, with excellent people. It, is it your testimony, sir, that when you left, which was, I believe, uh, on November 1984, the agency was running in a very fine fashion? 
No, I didn't say that, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, then but please, I, but I, but I please think we, I, I, give I, me your characterization. Well, I think we had made tremendous strides and made tremendous improvements. Uh, I can give you examples in, in different areas. Now, so what were the remaining problem areas when you left in well, I, at the I, end of November of 84? Well, one of the major problems was that uh, you had a tremendous change in focus of the agency due to the Housing and Urban Rural Recovery Act of 1983 uh, that ended programs and started new programs, uh, changed the emphasis uh, of, uh, of the agency. And as we were trying to implement these changes in programs uh, and uh, implement uh, a greater emphasis on management, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples. I mean, at one time, FHA owned 77,000 single family houses uh, and had a turnover time that was, uh, I don't recall exactly how long it was, but it was extensive. Uh, Approximately. I, it was, might have been uh, over a year. Uh, we got that number down to 17,000 houses owned by FHA and a turnover time of somewhere around six months and going downwards. Uh, the time to process an FHA mortgage and, a, and When you were under secretary, did uh, the agency receive the proceeds of sales? To the best of my knowledge, it did, yes. We, we had set up a computer system did, to did, track. Did previous testimony surprise you that uh, we had an agent in this area who, by her own admission, diverted five and a half million dollars to her own bank account? It surprised me, yes. Do you think it was a unique case? I hope so. But the Inspector General testified there are a number of such cases. Well, that, that's unfortunate. We had one of our proposals on... Well, how do you reconcile this efficient computerized system you well, put in place we with, with what uh, the Inspector General finds is a, is a virtually total lack of uh, adequate internal controls? The, the computerization of the system started in 1981. As we got funded, uh, the uh, Office of Administration was implementing the computerization. It wasn't complete uh, when I stopped having responsibility for the housing programs uh, in the fall of 83, but it was well along the way. And I, as I understand, uh, continued uh, through 1984. And I would expect that those management systems are in place and that uh, the, the computers would turn out uh, the sales and expected receipts. Why it didn't, I don't know. Well, Mr. Abrams, you're a very intelligent man, obviously. Explain to me why the, the Attorney General of the United States has directed U.S. attorneys across this country to examine all hard field offices for possible fraud mismanagement, abuse, theft, embezzlement. Why Secretary Kemp has asked for this? And while the agency is the focus of national attention as an agency in absolute disarray. I mean, your testimony is that from 81 to 84, from the 81? agency, from 81 to 84, your tenure, the agency was on the upward trail you were putting in better systems, more efficient systems, better controls. Did you have any reason to expect that after your departure, things will turn around completely? No, and, I, and Mr. Chairman, to be clear, I did, uh, and, and I think you did clearly restate what I said, which was it was on the upswing, and things were being brought under control. What I was starting to say uh, earlier was that with the change in, in programs, and the change in emphasis to management uh, and to uh, programs that were uh, administered on a, on a local level, like vouchers and rental rehab, rather than programs that were administered out of Washington. Uh, there was a need for oversight of those programs, uh, but there was also a need to retrain the employees, because it isn't fair to take an employee who had been working at HUD during an era when all of the uh, employment standards, uh, I, I think it's EPI's uh, 
that are used uh, to, for merit uh, increases for career employees were all set in terms of how many units of new construction were started under their area of expertise. And, and they did a good job at that. And then to, to take and tell those people, uh, now we're changing our emphasis 